There we go. So, hey everyone, this is, <laughs> I guess, the second episode, session, reading, I don't know, in the Misery Loves Company social reading series. And um, last week was a lot of fucking fun. <laughs> And we're, we're going to try this again. We, right now I have five writers who are scheduled to read at some point tonight. And that'll probably take, I'm thinking, an hour and a half to two hours. After that, um, we'll have an open mic period where anyone who wants to read can read. If you decide you want to read near the end of the readers, I'll kind of let you know it's time. And at that point, you can start indicating in the chat that you want to read Rudy, uh, Misery Tourism co-owner, co-editor, Rudy is here, right? Hey. Rudy's going to be keeping his eye on the chat, and so he'll be tracking people who want to participate in the open mic. So uh, with that said, the only thing I ask, it looks like we've got about 20 people here already, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. The only thing I ask is if you're not reading, please mute your mic, um, just because... I don't want to be a stickler about this kind of anarchy is the way in misery tourism, but it, it can get pretty intrusive and you never know if background noise might feed in and disrupt someone reading. So without uh, further ado, whatever, fuck it. <laughs> I, I, according to the queue I have here, I have Rachel Cass up first. Are you here, Rachel? Yes. If I can figure out how to unmute myself. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Hey, Rachel. Hi. Um, Thanks for are you going to be reading the poems that you put up on Neutral Spaces first? Okay, yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I just, what I'm going to be doing here is as people read, I'm going to be putting links to their work in the chat and also putting them up on Twitter so that you can kind of follow along if you awesome. like. So you can take it away, Rachel. All right. <clears throat> Hide away. A hand, curly fry fingers, off the edge of the bed, off the edge of the edge, palm a cave, concave, a mouth closed in weight, pushing ice with skates, falling just to say, I am brave. Honey out of the rock. Am I speaking loud enough? You sound perfect. Okay. And also, sorry about that. I put the long, wrong link in the chat first. The link I just put in the chat, the neutral spaces link is the correct one. Sorry. Cool. No problem. Honey out of the rock. <clears throat> Tourmaline flex. Evil eye nest. Kiss my son's kepi. Yet to exist. He'll smile wet figs. Turn the dial up fast. Old troubadour songs. He opens his hands. The other half of his fig juices like Schwitz. Each seed a sippy roth, tree of life, Baku wrote, something loud was born here. <clears throat> and last one from Neutral Spaces, um, Lost. Our matching foot freckles, the poetry you typed on dollar bills, the ostrich egg you stole for me, you're yelling on the street corner that you love me. Why didn't I? Why couldn't I? I should have. You're a heavy sense memory. Bodega chicken wings. Lucky strikes and screwing in your parents' backyard. <laughs> okay. So the rest... <laughs> the rest are from my book, Jewess in a Forest and Other Poems out now from Dostoevsky wannabe. Can you tell that I'm really comfortable with self-promotion? <laughs> hey, that's great. You have to be. <laughs> in, in, this, in this industry, you have to be. <laughs> And we published a couple of poems from the book, right? Yeah. yeah. I'm going to read one of them right now, actually. Awesome. Cool. <clears throat> it's called Withdrawal. Get out of bed. Buy your meds with grocery money chosen. Call your doctor, which aisle hides? Pharmacy line, iPhone shake. Can you hear me? 
Doc said, if I panic, handshake iPhone dimensions of trying. Doc said extra half what time they stare at me shaking always emergency speeding concrete fluoride spine window dizzy feel them staring the doc said he said i could take an extra did i leave the house dissect what time sky judgment also by insecticide strained neck eaten heavy head appropriate Dry tongue, bleeding gums, cleaning, made to clean. Where is the line I stand in? Where is the line? My posture buckled. AM, PM. Forced pandering, instructional being. Is this the line? AM, flailing. Legs full daylight, poking cadaver, insecticide. Are the AM already nothing but misdiagnosis? First I teetered into those meds, 35 pounds of Bilify sweat. Inconclusive hope has limits. Every rec rec recovery program, even people have, people have limits. In love, can't be, I can't, you can't be, I can't, you pray. One hand upon clip art quotations. Mishugana, turn away. Spend three quiet days preparing to be acceptable for public consumption. Ignore myself to get on this bus, all for one appointment. Therapy cannot define a brain, but it does so it fits on a page. Insane to this crazy, that's just how it is. I bring you this piece of paper, same time, each month, proving my brain to you, the person looking at me like that. The doc said I could take another half. I had so many panic attacks, and I didn't even know that. There's two days before the 13th. I can't. Would you look at my face? Dun, da, da, da. <laughs> okay. Some shorter ones. That was awesome. Thank you. This is so weird because like the there's no the energy is all like virtual <laughs> in a machine. I'm like outside that's the thing that's yeah, it's it's very yeah. strange because like you can kind of if you look up in the screen sometimes you can see someone clapping but it's not the same as that kind of like and people want to be polite so they don't want to be like oh my god <laughs> you know after yeah exactly exactly and also no, but, sorry go on i'm just pulling up my list here okay Okay, so this is called impression. Impression. My mother holds an orb, a myriad of wanting more. She pinned my arm cold, peach colored tile, above my head straight, a minute hand idle, weeping face red, my, 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 my. Large pink plastic blade, small hairy armpit cave. I was 12, it was time. It was time. What's next? Beautiful. I love endings like that. Moon pie. Moon pie. Pushing back nose cartilage, age six. Britney Spears Nazola, ultimate wish. Or Barbie, that shiksa. Ava Garner, perfection. Hitler's dick's idolatry. Jewish lady Barbara knew. Plastic bodies with aprons and red cherries, microwave dough-filled forgiveness. Just, <laughs> just kavilta fish with a little contempt and a birthday wish. Never forget any swan could turn to violence. That was so dope. <laughs> Thank you. Am I good on time? I don't want to like take a Oh yeah, no, you're great on time. You can, if you want to read a couple more, you absolutely can. At whatever point you feel like you, you're kind of done, we're fine with that. But you, I, I, you, I've been thinking like vaguely ballpark, like 20 minutes per person. Some people have done a little more than that. Some people a little less, just whatever your level of comfort is. That's plenty of time, thank you. Um, okay, so this is called Unreliable Source Material. 
My mother, she planted a rose bush in her dollhouse, our backyard, in corduroy overalls. She was the real life Nora. And Shvesta, she was only four. She didn't speak much, but I heard her. She's the real life Aurora. Sunday mornings, I'd hold her, mom and dad yelling a circle down the hall, my hand a soft baby lion paw. We lived where the sky rained ripe peaches. We lived as earth creatures, the lions we wanted to be. Our sentience sits in the same place which holds all that is too holy to know. Sorry. <laughs> okay. That was amazing, and I'm making sure I have you added on Twitter. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, this one's called Surus. Vertebrae sings ventriloquist song, a dream and a dream where she can be alone. Fear comes back from the grocery store, tells vertebrae everything is your fault. Fortitude lifts while foiling splits, invisible race between nerves and the hips. Alive inside a molasses air tank, shoulder blades nodding the yarn of the face. But vertebrae says carry on. She knows that it won't be for long. Fear's sentiment corrodes with the action of being. He'll start to say vertebrae doesn't deserve anything. Sometimes nowhere feels the best. Vertebrae sweeps her blue songs. Sometimes nowhere feels the best. Is the best thing what? Sometimes nowhere is the best. Mm. Sometimes nowhere is the best. <laughs> um, okay, dumplings. Dumplings, oh, I think, no, it's not on, never mind. Dumplings in a dream are not dumplings, but a dream. Lying on the couch all day, glass of water, a highly disgusting smoothie, four coloring books, a myriad of psychiatric and anti-inflammatory medication, anti-inflammatory Jewish history books, anti-inflammatory pretzel sticks, anti-inflammatory medicinal cannabis, anti-inflammatory inflammatory apple products, anti-inflammatory cats sleeping on feet, anti-inflammatory silent reckoning, anti-inflammatory blank wall screaming, anti-inflammatory self-loathing, smack the mind's muddied puddle, challenge my intentions with a scent. Ugh. Um. I'll read one more. This is called Burnt Flower Bed. She's here again on a train with me. Last night she sat on my bed, watched me sleeping, told my limbs to stir. Green light surrounding a transparent smile with handkerchief tied neck, deep purple cotton dress, sleeves sewn down to wrist. She showed me her palm and I gave her my own. The lines were the same, but her fingers were bursting with gravel. Calluses slid palm to palm, aiding and abetting. The other side of seeing is a sound like hearing a loved one wince softly in their sleep. Waiting, she sits on my bed, waiting the hem of her dress, waiting the bones are a breath, makes broth. I would like bow, but you can't really see. <laughs> no, that that was fantastic. Yeah. You know, yeah, it was awesome. I was really, really I enjoy am, the wordplay. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> I'm honestly and unequivocally blown away by your poetry. I remember when you submitted to Misery Tourism. I and Rudy can attest to this too. We were both like, wow. <laughs> like, I think especially especially from like a structural perspective, like the way withdrawal is structured is like so much, like for anyone who's been through that, like sort of, ex not even like with that sense of like medical withdrawal, but that kind of extreme, like depressive state where every thought is like being 
just like painfully drawn out of you. Like the, yeah. the cadence of that poem, I think perfectly captures that sensation in an almost legitimately painful way. I appreciate that so much. Yeah, I, I wrote that when I was like lost in Oakland on a bus trying to get to my meds at CVS, but they were having, they were like weren't filling it for some weird reason. And um, I was really disoriented and confused, but I felt the need to record that moment. It felt really important. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it I definitely know, feels it very, uh, of, like, very real. Riding on the bus. Pardon? Has anyone else done a lot of their favorite writing on a bus or like subway? Thing? I definitely have. <laughs> You're kind of just forced to sit with your thoughts. So, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Oh my god. Uh, gallery. And now I can. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know I've gotten to stand on the other side of the counter watching patients going through those exact emotions. So I definitely felt that in a different level. That was really well done. So there, I think Bibles is on the move. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, there's a line in there in that withdrawal one. Uh, those meds, thirty-five pounds of Dolphy sweat. That I don't know why, but that just speaks volumes to me. Um, I'm so it's, glad. Uh, that really. That's why I do it. Um, but, yeah. Also, because I these cute kids or something. <laughs> um, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. So, um, 35 pounds of Billify Sweat. I work with a lot of sonic theory, like theories around vibrational healing and sonic mm -hmm. energy that um, can connect you to the essence of the word and not just the sound or the image of the word. I so, see, yeah. Which I guess the essence would probably be all of those things, actually. Yeah, I mean, it just provokes a vivid image and also vivid feels and that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's it's yeah. All, all, all in one. <laughs> So did anyone else have any questions, comments for Rachel? I'll give people a second here if they do. And if not, we are going to move on to the um, next uh, author in the queue here. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I was very, actually very happy when you volunteered to read because Rudy and I both really enjoy your work a lot. Oh, yay. I love you guys. Oh, I feel so good. <laughs> So, uh, Josh is up next, I believe. Put, sure. You hear Josh? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. I'm going to put uh, the poems that you are reading today were previously published in Back Patio Press, right? Yeah. I'm going to start, I think, with those. Although I, I want to start with uh, like a, uh, what I find to be like an inspirational quote. Sure. Hey, go from, at it. <laughs> from Stu Unger. He was like the um, world champion of poker in like 1980. Um, he won like $30 million and then uh, died of cocaine. But he, he said, I never want to be called a good loser. Show me a good loser and I'll just show you a loser. So I, yeah, I think that's my inspirational quote. And then um, also Rachel, uh, I really like that reading. Um, obviously anything on Dostoevsky wannabe is, is solid. I misheard one of your lines as uh, saying any swan could turn into Vivance. <laughs> but I think that's mostly because of pharmaceuticals. Uh, <laughs> for me in Very my cool. opinion. If that's where your mind goes, then. But it'd be, you know, it's like a remix. Sorry, it was like a remix. But I your original one was better, but that's what I heard because <laughs> of just drugs in my brain all the time. Um, <laughs> yeah, so the first three uh, were in Back Patio Press. So thank you, Kevin Gonzalez, for tolerating me. 
uh, space me like Laika. When I think of what I'm most jealous of, I think of Russian space junk, satellite shot into the atmosphere, Laika burning up or lost, careening, cosmic software in need of updates, that famous photo of Earth taken from 6 billion kilometers away, indifference like CAA auto insurance, uselessness like a store dedicated to fidget spinners at the Dufferin Mall. Title was stolen from a Tinder profile. I PayPal'd her like 20 bucks for that, so seems fair. American Thanksgiving. Oh yeah, and as an aside, uh, a lot of this was written on uh, public transit. I think someone raised that. American Thanksgiving. I'll see if my bitch ass family is available, says the man with the knuckle tattoos before exiting the train with his girlfriend. It was American Thanksgiving not too long ago. Uh, that was around 6.30 p.m. on Sunday, December 1st, 2019. Humidity. On my way home, they were rolling a corpse out of the seniors' facility. I didn't see the body. It was wrapped in a thick white cover. It was such a humid night. August 13th, 2019, 12.55 a.m. Um, so I can read, like, whatever, right? Yeah, absolutely. I put a link to the three poems that you sent me from Back Patio Press. But if you have unpublished work that you want to read, or if you just want to read anything, feel free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so a couple more. Uh, so this is also in Back Patio Press. Uh, maybe I can send a link later. It's the um, first thing they published, actually. Uh, how to Tell Stories to Children. Uh, how to Tell Stories to Children was originally published in 1905. Sarah Cohn Bryant wrote it. She was an author of children's books. Sometimes I think my life is being written by an author of children's books, like Sarah Cohn Bryant. Things are oversimplified. Dogs play a disproportionate role in the plot. There is whimsy that just seems sad to normative adults. Anyway, you were reading How to Tell Stories to Children on April 19th, 2017, around 9.45 p.m while riding the streetcar. Your pants were pea green and wide legged, your hair brown like blonde. You were probably an art school major, your major probably conceptual. You just sat beside me because there was an empty seat, but maybe also because I was reading, but maybe not because I was reading. The streetcar driver was a comedian. He asked, what kind of room has no windows or doors? And right away you replied a mushroom. It wasn't rehearsed at all. Your brain just worked like that. Nobody else had answered or even tried. And then you went back to reading how to tell stories to children. I continued reading Landscape with Traveler, a novella by Barry Gifford published in 1980. I wanted to get to know your brain. I wanted to be a streetcar operator, but you got off at Dover Court and I took the streetcar to Lansdowne. Bodega. Uh, I feel like sad corner store fruit. I'm a little bit sad. I'm a little bit expired. I'm a little bit bruised. I wasn't always like this, but it's how I am now. You'll find me beside the Lay's chips and the gummies. You'll find me under unflattering light. You'll find me at unexpected hours. Um, let me just find post-it notes. I tried to be organized. Uh, they fucked up my printing job. Uh, so, I was thinking of reading some fiction, which I haven't published in a very long time. I had some stuff published in Hobart. Uh, thank you, I don't know what they were thinking. Uh, how much time do I have, by the way? So, um... As I, as I kind of said with Rachel, we're pretty f flexible here. I was thinking in uh, the neighborhood of 20 minutes per person, which would give you another 10 to 15. Sure. But you also can choose, you know, if you're not comfortable with that, you can, whenever you feel comfortable, you know. <laughs> oh, no, I love the attention. I'm going to use every minute possible. Um, so I have a short story. I'm kind of, I don't know, workshopping it. It's uh, called Florida Man. Um, and so 
here it is, Florida man. I do another line and it's like I'm in my own time zone. I'm in the bathroom of my basement apartment, cutting up some more blow with my government issued health card. I like the irony. My friends are just outside in the kitchen. The only thing separating us is the door. They're singing now. That's Yuri. He's come over for one of my sausage parties. There are girls here too, because it's not that kind of sausage party. We're literally here to eat the sausages that Yuri prepares and listen to some house music. We might go to the Portuguese sports bar across the street later, play the weird interactive sex game on the console by the front. I'll show you what it looks like. I actually have like, I don't know if it'll even like show, but it's like, it's this weird game where there's two sexual images and there's like a difference in the images and you have to use like, um, you have to point out what the difference is and then, and then you get points and then you can play again. But now Yuri is shouting because the sausages are sizzling. That is their song and he is the conductor. If my nose weren't perpetually stuffed, I think that they would smell good to me, the sausages. This symphony of blood and gristle. I remain optimistic. It seems plausible that my brain will learn to fill in the blanks for my nostrils, like how it does with vision. We don't really see everything, you know. Our brain just makes certain assumptions to round out the images that comprise a life, like this one right now. I flush the toilet out of habit. You are a peasant and your taste is provincial. Yuri is chewing somebody out for taking a sip of craft beer straight from the bottle. Philistine, another sip. He's in good spirits because it's months before his wife asks for a divorce. I know this because I just happened to be writing in the present tense about this one afternoon in the history of my life. April and Luca are here in the basement too. Nothing bad happens to them in the coming months. April ends up buying a Honda CRV before summer ends and Luca visits Japan. Luca is gay and adds to the diversity of my friends. If Luca were in a wheelchair right now, I'd have an even more diverse group of friends. I think suddenly about crippling Luca. It's important to consider these things. Mennonite fucking sausage, says Yuri, playing up his bounty, which he scored from a religious butcher in Kensington Market. He puts a plate of the greasy meat on the table. It's bubbling, and I really wish I could smell the meat, if only to counter its appearance. The blueberry venison looks like a gangrenous dick. I want to put on a t-shirt. Mennonite fucking sausage, April says. She's drinking an Aperol spritz. April elaborates on plans for her silk screening business. Boutique, definitely. And I realize I actually have no idea how to cripple Luca. April has relatives in Palm Beach and will never know self-doubt. At least she's yet to experience it even today as I write this while she takes her Honda CRV in for an oil change. Mennonite fucking sausage. I feel like if I wore that on a t-shirt, I'd be microaggressing everyone I say. Make me one that says Zika. I'm arbitrarily injecting Zika in uh, the Zika virus into conversations. Then I'm talking about the white sands of Pensacola, Florida. The winter retreat of my childhood. Did you know it lays claim to the world's whitest beaches? All that white powder. I wonder if I'm a Florida man. Hold on, going back to Pensacola, I say, heading for the bathroom. Well, that's sweet. I hear some ambience, but I'm going to deal with it. Uh, the trouble with blow isn't the direct cost. I can get a half G for like 40 bucks from this Asian syndicate that operates like Uber. I just text them a location and then they send a car. It'll either be the fat Asian or the bald Asian. Today I'm at the fat Asian. No, the trouble with blow is that once you're willing to put $40 up your nose in the evening, everything seems cheap by comparison. Everything is discounted. It's on sale. Pretty sure I spent $5,000 last year on the indirect cost of blow. But I'm not thinking about that right now. Instead, I'm thinking about the white sands of Pensacola, how my 
feet felt on the beach, how the sand is hot enough to burn your souls. I could never work a nine to five, April is saying. She isn't wearing a bra and I can see her nipples through her ribbed American apparel shirt. Somewhere a baby is being born with deformities that a mosquito net couldn't catch. And I go into the bathroom again and the only thing separating us is the door. Um, that was one unpublished story. And then I think I'll just finish it off with uh, a poem about my uh, uh, prostate. If I can find it in time. Um, that was good too. Sorry, one second. That's fine. Take your time. I love the the image, the like neurotic imagery in the last story, like that, just like stream of consciousness, like. <laughs> Very good. Any Thanks. I feel like it's unhinged. Like I haven't read. I mean, I, funny thing is, is that I think my mom's boyfriend and my young sister are listening in on the reading. So I just want to say that, um, you know, as a disclaimer, uh, I don't know anything about drugs. And, um, you know, it, it, these are fictional uh, devices that I use, you know, uh, it, it's like science fiction. You know what I mean? It just doesn't exist. And you just, yeah. Right, everything's speculative, right? Yeah, no, this is totally speculative yeah, yeah, fiction. You know, it's all fiction, right? <laughs> yeah. That was mom's voice. <laughs> oh, yeah, my, my mom. Shout out to my mom, my biggest supporter. I mean, she created me. She created a monster, some might say, but okay. So the last bit, uh, final poem, it's about my prostate and also my father. Uh, quite don't know. Plotless. I never knew my father. You could say that this has shaped me somehow. Like him, I'm inescapably a coward. Don't get me wrong, I mean this without bitterness. After all, cowards don't typically die stupid deaths. Their pain is mostly self-inflicted. Have I mentioned that the thought of my prostate terrifies me? Sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat with the feeling that someone with murderous intentions has broken into my apartment. Then I realize it's just my prostate. I've read that a healthy prostate is soft, a sick one firm. Somehow this thought does not comfort me. I've never felt a part of my body. I've always felt a victim of my body. Once I met an older man who wanted to make me his lover. That is, he wanted to fuck me in a hotel in Ottawa during the 2007 chess championships. We were both participants in the tournament. In his Marriott hotel suite, he said, it's funny how the people we get closest to are often the ones we end up cutting out of our lives eventually. We never got very close despite his efforts. He once tried to seduce me with coconut shrimp, a 26er of Smirnoff vodka, and a tray of crackers. Still, I remember what he said. I often think all people have to offer are words, and I'm not sure whether this is a wonderful thing or something I should feel profoundly sad about. In any case, I don't think I'll be writing about my father I never knew. From the start, I think I've been subconsciously trying to write a plotless story, just so I can have a copy of it on tight books, plotless fiction shelf. That's a store in Toronto, they have a shelf that actually says that. I've always wondered about that shelf. Is anything really plotless? My life, probably. And, uh, well, I think we're neat and tidy at uh, less than 20 minutes, so that's it. Oh, well, thank you very much, Josh. I really appreciate it. And <laughs> I, I, I got a real kick out of a lot of that. I love the being jealous of space junk uh, thing. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, it's funny, a while ago, um, and I don't, I try not to bring up my own work whenever I can because it's the oh, most yeah. narcissistic thing in the world. But a while ago, I wrote a poem uh, when the Opportunity Rover was, when they lost communication with the Opportunity Rover, I, I wrote a poem about that that was similar in tone, kind of being like, wow, it's, I guess it's a shame I'm not dead on Mars, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I just want to be fucking flaming, hot trash, careening through the end, you know what I mean? It just seems enviable, I don't know. That's my biggest influence too. That's my biggest influence, yeah. <laughs> it really does. Um, does anyone have any questions, comments for Josh? Give it 
give that a second. And if not, we'll uh, move I on. really like Florida, man. That uh, I have nothing against the great state of Florida. Um, and actually, I actually know very little about Florida except for uh, that there is a lot of cocaine there, and um, <laughs> and that uh, people do stupid things there. So it it definitely it definitely delivered on both of those. It, it felt like a Florida. The title was perfect, honestly, because it felt like one of those um, those exposés about someone doing something nuts in Florida. Well, and thanks. I, I really, I just really love that one. That title actually was like, it's an obvious title, but I uh, I had many different titles before I was like, no, nah, I'm I'm because I live in Canada, right? I'm coming from like yeah. uh, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, and I'm like. But I, but I, as a Jew, I grew up like with Florida vacations. So I'm like, I'm a, I'm a Florida man. Just call it Florida man. Like I'm a Florida man. I'm all about that lifestyle. So yeah. Thank, 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 thank awesome. My house, my grandparents. <laughs> well, I want to be in the Jewish diaspora for like just writing fiction about like summer trips as a kid in Florida, like Broward County represent. <laughs> oh, all right. Um, <laughs> So uh, next up, uh, so Hestia would have been up next, uh, but I got a uh, DM from her on Twitter. I guess something came up and she can't make it tonight. So um, I maybe next week she'll be able to read. So moving on, I think Catherine is next up. Catherine Sino, did I get that Hi. last name right? Yeah. Hey, Catherine. Now you're going to be reading something that was published on Misery Tourism, right? Um yeah, isn't that the point of this thing? <laughs> well, I don't know. Actually, last um, last week, I think out of the like six people who read during the the scheduled readings and the other half dozen or so who read during the open mic, maybe one piece was actually published on Misery Tourism. So it's a big tent <laughs> that we have here. That's weird. Yeah, but anyway, yeah, take it away. <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm going to be reading a piece called um, Vegan YouTubers versus the Petting Zoo. And it's about um, vegan YouTubers who uh, go uh, butt heads with a petting zoo that comes to their high school. And it was inspired by a guy named Jackson Foster. No one likes Jackson Foster. Um, you guys can all look him up if you want. Okay, I'm going to start reading right now. Um, okay. The announcement. Every lunch period, Ethan ate his soy riso scrambles and paced around, flexing his biceps and leading the group in animal rights discussions. Nicolette often recorded herself eating her all fruit lunch, maybe doing a few cartwheels. The footage would undoubtedly make its way to her YouTube channel, Carrot Top Raw. Sam sat against the little brick wall with her laptop working on a zine that reviewed albums by vegan hardcore bands. But on a certain Monday, things did not go as normal during the period before lunch when the teachers were supposed to play the Daily Bulletin PowerPoint. Only the teacher in Nicolette's class turned it on so Sam and Ethan didn't see it. Among advertisements for Relay for Life and a piting contest was a horrific sight. Coming 12-12, cute petting zoo, see baby goats, sheep, chickens, and more. Nicolette photographed the ad and sent it to Ethan and Sam. What the fuck? 20 exclamation points, she texted. The three met at lunch with somber eyes. We know what we have to do, said Sam, throwing her fists into her palm. We need to fight this to the ends of the earth. Sweet little animals are being squished in spiky cages and treading in their own waste. And it's our responsibility to stop their captors. Nobody else will. She paused for a moment. Then she screamed into the air at the top of her lungs. The first attempt. Hello, Principal Lyons. My friends and I would like to meet with you on a very important matter. Please propose a good time and we will be there. Sincerely, Ethan Osborne. Principal Lyons didn't reply to this nor the three follow-up emails, so Nicolette resorted to making an appointment at the front desk under a random name they lifted from the yearbook. As Principal Lyons expected Ashley Watson to walk into her office, she instead saw three teenagers who she had grown to dislike so much that even her husband knew every last detail. Well, if it isn't the weakling trio, she said, letting out a chuckle. The gorilla is the strongest mammal and it's vegan, pointed out Ethan. 
We don't really appreciate the demeaning names, said Sam. We're here regarding something very important. Oh, I'm sure, said Principal Lyons. The three sat down. Something terrible is happening, said Nicolette, punctuating her sentences by taking bites from a rambutan fruit. A petting zoo is coming to campus on December 12th. Oh, really, said Professor Lyons. That sounds delightful. It's not, though, said Sam. These animals are trapped in cages as they are transported from place to place, forced to tread in their own waste. They can't even turn around. I'm sure they are, Miss Zhang. But don't you want to hang out with cute, fluffy little sheep? I just might have to get out there myself. Please, said Ethan. We're begging you. Nobody takes us seriously. We're trusting you, the principal of the entire school, to give the animals a voice. You're the only one who can help. My job is to manage students, not animals, Ethan. Then do it for us, he said. This is our goal, our battle, our passion. My nighttime tears, said Sam. Majority rules, said Principal Lyons, slamming her hand on the desk. I think most of our students would simply love to pet sweet, fluffy little goats and sheep. So get out. I have important business to attend to. No, screamed Sam. You don't understand. The principal pressed a button on her desk. Boys, she said, take these crutchy hooligans away. Two security guards entered and the trio soaked out with any, without any force required. Foiled, said Ethan as the three walked back to their lunch spot. Sam was beginning to cry. She thinks it's so funny, the bastard, but they don't know how it makes me feel. I'm not a joke. The slaughter of the 120 million animals they chair is not a joke. Nicolette put one arm around Sam while eating a persimmon with the other. Um, the world is an unbelievably cruel, horrid place. You have to keep your head high and know that you are doing all you can. Sam wiped her tears away. Suddenly, Danny Kellogg, president of the Keto Club, approached. He was built with lean muscle and a mop of tousled brown hair rested atop his head. He was wearing a t-shirt with a mutton leg on it. Well, 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 isn't it club anti-vax? Proudly, said Nicolette. Danny Kellogg, gasped Ethan. Will you ever pick up your cholesterol-filled agenda and push it somewhere else? Not a chance, said Danny. Butterbrains has 35 members and counting. 16 people showed up to the last meeting. Shut that mouth of yours, Danny, said Ethan. Your intellectual foundation is built upon a bed of meat-based protein powder. Oh, like that time you told me that grass has more protein than beef, said Danny. Well, said Ethan, that's simply the truth. It's a little known fact, but grass has 50, five, zero percent protein. I looked that little factoid up last time, said Danny. There's a whole Wikipedia article on it. Most fruits and vegetables have under 5% protein. The most protein-rich plant is peanuts at up to 28%. Meanwhile, moose game is 80, 80% protein. Wikipedia can't be trusted, said Nicolette. It's controlled by big food. Is it you behind this petting zoo, Danny? Asked Sam. Is it you that's enslaving sweet young beings and forcing them to undergo brutal abuse by humans under the guise of petting? Oh, I wish. I think it's actually SAPS, said Danny, referring to the Student Association for the Prevention of Sexual Violence. Hashtag me too, while a highly positive revolution is triggering for many. SAPS thought cuddling animals would help, and I'm inclined to agree. Those cunts, said Sam, wiping her eyes. I must be off, said Danny. He waltzed into the distance. The nerve of that Danny, said Ethan, sheltering the tearful Sam. Nicolette folded her arms. Since the first day I saw him eating a beef jerky snack in the fifth grade, I knew he was bad news. That night, Ethan cracked his knuckles and sat down at his computer for his weekly video upload. His new vid was called 75 Reps, Have I Got Mad? Nah, just to fit vegan but he didn't see the typo until after he uploaded and decided to leave it. He was hoping it would catch a decent amount of views because his last video had seen over 40,000. That video was a 10,000 calorie challenge in which he had eaten mostly prepackaged cupcakes along with some baked potatoes. Ethan only had 6,000 followers. He spent a moment wondering if he should be as devoted to his YouTubing as Nicolette was. Carrot Top Raw had 50,000 followers and a host of diverse content. Just in the past month, she had made videos with titles like 10 Myths About Eating Disorders That are, You Definitely Didn't Know and ASMR Tapping on Coconut Shell, Sexy, Relaxing, Chill Vibes. Recently, Nicolette had started dating a guy she had met on Instagram named Caleb. He supposedly had 120,000 followers. 
He once dated 16 apples, Nicolette had said. 16 apples had over a million followers and pretty much every woke vegan watched her. All her followers made him feel emasculated. It's better for him to have someone like me with less followers who makes him feel like a breadwinner. Vegan bread, of course. Ethan wondered whether his lower number of followers made him less attractive. It's not like he wanted Nicolette as a loving companion, but sometimes he thought if she asked him out, would he say yes? He looked up Caleb, whose social media handle was Full Metal Carrot. He had a handsomely structured face and dreadlocks, even though he looked white. He had a speckled tank with a, great, uh, with a screen print of Ganesh on it, medium-sized plugs in his earlobes, and many bracelets and necklaces. My fruit friends, said Caleb in a silky, deep, engaging voice. Today we unite in this safe space for compassionate eating, a refuge from the ignorant ones, bless their hearts truly, and celebrate kind food, being kind to our bodies and being kind to the earth. Today we are going to follow the sacred ritual of food preparation and step by step, we will create and drink this smoothie I like to call Durian Oasis. Ethan found himself sucked into Caleb's subtle, graceful mannerisms. And now we put in just a little scoop of this lovely, lovely protein powder, heart compassion from Happy Gut. This is available only through independent health consultants. Link to my lovely friend Elisa's Happy Gut e-commerce boutique below. And now we pour our beautiful, lovely granulated powder into this NutriShed blender equipped with microcut blades that spin on seven different motors. Let's activate the organic energy pulse setting. Oh yeah, mmm, that's the stuff. Ethan sunk into his seat a little. You know, he said to himself, it's not good to compare myself. Competition is a primitive human instinct from the hunter-gatherer days when we ate meat and clawed our way to reproduction. I am better than this. Ethan washed his face with all natural cleanser and went to bed. The second attempt. Ethan woke up. I'm just gonna like look and see if everyone's still there. Okay. People are listening, that's cool, okay. Ethan woke up the next morning to 16 messages. It seemed as though Nicolette and Sam had gotten together an hour ago for a spontaneous activism session. He drove to Sam's house while sipping on a vegan protein shake. Sam lived in a gated community called Whispering Clouds. Sam answered the door and they went, on one of the went into one of the bonus rooms that Sam had designated her creative studio. Sam and Nicolette showed Ethan what they had had so far as they snacked on some star fruits. It was a video alternating between Nicolette talking on a black background and cute petting zoo type animals cooped up in trailers. It included comments such as, petting zoo animals are often drugged like third world traffic children so they don't lash out. And only you, Superintendent Binghamton, can stop this petting zoo atrocity. Amazing work, said Ethan. He recorded some voiceovers and talking headshots to contribute. After a few hours of grueling editing and a delicious homemade salad for lunch, they uploaded it to YouTube and emailed a link to the superintendent, CCing 10 or so people, including Principal Lyons, the president of SAPS, Danny Kellogg, and some random admin emails. They only got two responses. One was from Danny Kellogg, who said, get a life. The other was from the SAPS president, who said, I can't fucking believe this. I knew emailing Sunitha was a bad idea, said Ethan. Honestly, a lot of sexual assault could be prevented if people got high off of amazing foods like melons and not alcohol, said Nicolette. Watch what you say, said Sam. Alcohol is vegan after all. In fact, wine is raw. True. The third attempt. Nicolette sat at her vanity and opened her MacBook. While dining on a bowl of pomelos, she admired her laptop stickers in the mirror. A cow, a pig, and a chicken with a banner underneath reading, friends not food an avocado with a heart-shaped pit, an udder with the text, not yo mama, not yo milka. <laughs> okay, I couldn't hold it in on that one. She went on Facebook and messaged Caleb. Nicolette, nobody replied, crying emoji. The super doesn't give a flying fruit about animal rights, tear on forehead emoji, cow emoji. Caleb Knowles. Oh, baby girl, I'm so sorry, cat crying emoji. Have you ever thought of using the big loving power of your fans? A uh, heart with bow through it. Two people in love emoji, heterosexual. Tell them to make a diff. Powerful arm emoji, mango emoji. Make a change in this misguided but well-meaning world of cruelty. Fist emoji, 
uh, lettuce emoji, explosion emoji. Tell them to send their message, inbox emoji. If one voice can't be heard, then bring on the bellow of a millions, megaphone emoji. Nicolette, you have an amazing brain, my babe, vibrating heart emoji. What a gorgeous idea. Sunflower emoji, bowl of salad emoji, watermelon emoji. Nicolette opened her group chat with Ethan and Sam. Nicolette said, Plan C is brewing and man, does it feel like pineapple kombucha. Sunflower emoji, bowl of lettuce emoji, watermelon emoji. Results soon, pineapple emoji, cocktail emoji. Sam said, you go girl, skull emoji. Ethan said, crush them like a coconut shell, strong arm emoji, palm tree emoji, coconut shell emoji. Nicolette opened photo booth. She recorded another plea, this time to her YouTube followers, asking them to contact Principal Lyons and beg with all their might to cancel the petting zoo. After uploading, she put some lavender essential oil in her diffuser and drifted into sleep. She had algebra two the next morning. Rick, the man on the golf cart with the ambiguous job, came in the room and called for her. He drove her to the principal's office. Engaging in some radical activities, Nicolette? I'm fighting every day of my life for the good of the animals. Once in the office, Nicolette settled down in the chair across Principal Lyons and began snacking on a kumquat. Nicolette. Yes, Principal Lyons? Death threats, Nicolette? Death threats? I have people in my inbox telling me they want to decapitate me with a taffy pulling machine. Um, I I'm sorry, I, I promise I didn't tell my fans to send death threats. Um, some of them are just very passionate. Enough, Nicolette. I already had to change my email. You're suspended for two weeks. If your friends kick up any more dirt, they'll meet the same fate. Fine, said Nicolette, who then stormed out of the office. Uh, the fourth attempt. The next day at lunch, only Ethan and Sam met up. I miss her, said Sam, but I know she's doing the right thing. A small martyrdom for our noble cause, said Ethan. Should we keep trying? Vegans never say die, said Sam. We've got to fight to our last breath. Say, I was thinking the other night, what if we didn't pressure them to take down the petting zoo? What if they had to? What, like a bomb threat? I was thinking that, but they'd suspect us. Maybe someone could be allergic to the sheep? I like that idea, but it would have to be someone that's not us. We could pay them. After a lunch discussion, along with a group chat that night, the new plan was born. They found themselves wondering why they never came up with something this brilliant before. They were going to locate a poor looking person and pay them a good sum of money. They debated over the amount, settling on $75. This person would then go to Principal Lyons, claim they had a severe goat allergy and suddenly threatened to sue. After discussing numerous options, they settled on a girl named Sierra in Sam's painting elective. She wears the same jacket every day and owns a PC, said Sam. Perfect, said Ethan. They cornered her after school and grilled her on her dietary preferences. And while she was not intentionally a vegetarian, she often avoided meat because she didn't like the taste. I mean, sure, I guess I can do it, she ended up saying. Can you make it $100? 85, said Sam firmly. Well, when do I get my money? After you've talked with the principal. Deal. They saw Sierra again the next day. Sierra, said Ethan in an overly friendly voice. What's the scoop? The lady was pretty skeptical. She asked if I knew someone named Nicolette. Uh, she's a nobody, said Sam. Well, asked Ethan, are they fulfilling your urgent request? Uh, not exactly, said Sierra. Lady says I need a doctor's note. Uh, that can be arranged, said Sam. Ethan and Nicolette met up that afternoon at Sam's house since she had Adobe Creative Cloud for making animal rights zines. After some clicking and dragging, font downloading, and debating over the most doctory colors, they had themselves a note. For extra realism, they used the name of Nicolette's stepdad's GP. For good measure, they put Ethan's cell phone number on the document. He was almost certain he had never disclosed it to the school. The trio emailed notes to FedEx office and Sam went alone to pick, up, pick them up later. They had ordered fancy paper and a quick touch revealed it to be supple and buttery, perfect for a wedding invitation. The woman at the counter didn't blink. Sam got home and changed into her soft cotton pajama bottoms and giant camp shirt from two years ago. She opened her MacBook and checked uh, all the PETA, so P 
PETA social media. She went to some of her favorite Facebook groups and found new videos of seals being clubbed. She then sent them in private messages to random people she knew. I just wanted to share this with you to let you know that animals are being senselessly tortured for our mindless benefit every day. Watch and pass on, stay woke. Their response to these messages varied. Some didn't reply, some unfriended her. Some said, Sam, really? And some thanked her for spreading the message. A few were actually interested. Sam didn't really care about her response. The adage, all publicity is good publicity had always resonated with her. She had almost gotten a stick and poke of it last summer, but decided to go with one that said, fight in place of the week. She went to the kitchen and made herself a glass of chocolate soy milk, her favorite. She worked on her vegan hardcore punk zine and listened to cattle decapitation on low volume before going to sleep at 3 a.m. Uh, just checking to make sure everyone's still watching. Okay, hi everyone. Okay. Your audience is still here. <laughs> Thanks. I just, I don't know. I just wanted to make sure like Zoom didn't like crash in the background and I didn't notice because I was so absorbed in reading this story that. But it's great. Uh, Keep going. Yeah. yeah, this is awesome. <laughs> tell, tell me, tell me after the story. Um, <laughs> I hate vegans so much. Oh my God. Okay. The next morning before class, Ethan and Sam handed three copies of the fake note to Sierra in a fake, in a, not fake, in a plastic folder. Is this doctor even real? She said. As a matter of fact, he is, said Ethan. He prayed that Professor Lyons wouldn't call. He really wasn't ready for this. Sam calmly sat through her classes, knowing the burden was all on Ethan. His phone rang the period after lunch and he dashed outside. Luckily, he didn't have to detour to take the bathroom pass. Uh, it had a large, it had a leather strap on it. And for this reason, the teacher had granted him exemption at the beginning of the year. Hello? Hello, is this the office of Dr. Sutton? The voice was clearly Principal Lyons. Uh, yes, this is he. Hi, this is Kathleen Lyons from San Diego Academy in Encinitas. I'm calling to confirm a note I received of a goat allergy for one of your patients named Sierra Gibb. Uh, yes, he said, his voice catching a bit in his windpipe. I wrote that note uh, just yesterday. She is uh, extremely allergic to goats and uh, must remain far from them at all costs. Very well then, I'll let you get back to your work. And I'll let you get back to your work, you very, very, very important principal. The moment the words came out of his mouth, he regretted them. Luckily, she hung up right after that. He took a detour to the bathroom and splashed cold water on his face. That afternoon, the group heard from Sierra on Facebook. Sierra, Lyons said she'd accommodate me swiftly. Sam said, cool, but I'm really jealous. Fire emoji, skull emoji. They don't do shit for us. Ethan said, Stay positive, Sam. Strong arm emoji, blue heart emoji, avocado emoji. Uh, thank you. Well, th aside, thank you to Misery Tourism for um, faithfully um, formatting my story with all the emojis. There is a lot of integrity that went into the publication of this piece. And for that, I'm deeply appreciative. Okay, back uh, to my story. Sorry, a shout out to Rudy for doing that. Uh, he's the one who formatted and put your piece up on the website. Oh, thank you. But we do yeah, try our best. <laughs> we do. <laughs> thank you. Not a problem. Very grateful. It was very important to the energy and atmosphere of this piece. Okay. The protest. The petting zoo was only two days away. The posters were still up the day before, but Ethan and Sam figured the sign taper uppers, whoever the hell those were, just didn't have the time to take them down. The ad still appeared on the Daily Bulletin PowerPoint, although Ethan and Sam did not see it because only Nicolette's teacher played it every day. The two did not expect to see the petting zoo at lunch on December 2nd, but there it was, behind a hazmat tent. A sign nearby read, fun petting zoo behind allergy-proof safety tent. Sam messaged Sierra on Facebook. Why the fuck did you tell us this was gonna happen? Sierra said, I just did what you said to do. I'm not obligated to do anything else. Fire emoji, Sam said, flaming cunt. Students flocked to the tent. Through the clear plastic windows, they could be seen taking selfies. We have to act, yelled Sam. We have to fucking protest. These animals are in danger. Quick, to the art room. The two quickly created posters inside one of the studios. Sam's read, they step in their own shit when you're not looking. And Ethan's read, don't give wages to proponents of cages. They ran back to the tent, held up their signs and chanted, don't give wages to proponents of cages. Don't give wages to proponents of cages. The two had decided that it rolled off the tongue better than what Sam's sign said. 
students stopped and ogled, some rolling their eyes or taking videos. Danny Kellogg stopped by with what looked like over 30 people, laughed, and went in the tent. Sunitha was nearby, encouraging other students to stay away from the protest. Ethan and Sam struggled on, something they'd learned from attending various other protests. Sam had also once taken a workshop called Vegan Mo Protest Masterclass. They even spotted Sierra walking in. You're a cunt! A flaming cunt! yelled Sam. Thanks for the money! Sierra yelled back. I just got some new headphones! Sam fell to the ground, rolled around, and screamed, Ouch! Ouch! That hurts! You ripped the wool from my back! You tore my skin! You imprisoned me in a cage! I roll in my own feces! You took the joy from my life! You stepped on my soul! You treated me like worth the dirt! Now I scream! Scream so you can hear me expunging the dying light in my soul so you can know how I've suffered! Ethan FaceTimed Nicolette, who had flown to Seattle to see Caleb during her suspension. Things are going great over here, Ethan said, displaying Sam's performance. We're really making an impact. Nicolette and Caleb were lounging in a hanging nest chair, a tropical plant garden blooming in the background. They were nuzzling closely and wearing matching green neon t-shirts reading Seattle plant-based 5K. I'm elated, said Nicolette. Fight for me, my durian darlings. You can do this, friends, said Caleb, breaking out his animated gestures. I'm sending boatloads of light and energy your way. I know you can fight the powers that be and triumph against all that is evil. I also recommend that next time you pre-order my dear friend Jess's protest in a box kit, available through a link on my website, fullmetalcarrot.com. Peace out, my brother and sister. Shine with all the heart in your soul. Sam and Ethan protested the whole lunch period. Most of the passerbys entered the tent, but a few discussed the signs with their friends and walked away, something that the duo saw as a major victory. At the end, a petting zoo employee approached them. I go to work to feed my family every day, and I get treated like this. I do not appreciate you at all. Sam replied, yeah, but is it meat you're feeding them? If so, you're worthless scum and deserve to rot in an unmarked grave. Four months later. It was a sunny day in May, and Sam and Nicolette shared a jackfruit and durian skewer at lunch. Ethan approached them. I have good news. What is it? The other two asked. I've just been accepted to Naropa University's vegan studies program. Oh my god! The others screamed. They jumped up and down and danced in a circle holding hands. They sang their favorite vegan chant. Ring around the rosy, pocket full of animal products, cancer, heart disease, mule fall down. They all fell hard onto the ground and laughed. I'm totally applying next year, said Nicolette. I've heard that they're going to make a concentration for making YouTube content. It would be so catered to my interests. It's true, and I'll be concentrating in the history of the animal genocide with some of the core classes taught by Professor Grape White Shark. You know, you've really been a hero to me. I think you deserve a reward in college education, said Nicolette. People will take you so seriously, said Sam. Those high schoolers don't know shit. You'll make a huge impact out there. Thank you, my friends, said Ethan. I sure hope so. It's always a long and hard road being a vegan activist, but it's worth it. The three hugged and shared their fruit and lentils out of glass Tupperware. Nicolette set up the tripod and filmed their lunch. As they all knew, this news was prime, and it would be attracting a lot of views on YouTube. That's the end of my story. That delivery was fucking fantastic. Oh, thanks. You absolutely killed it. <laughs> and the story was hilarious, too. Uh, mm -hmm. I know I really enjoyed it the first time I read it when you submitted it. And I know Rudy was fucking blown away by it. So <laughs> it's oh, fun to actually hear it performed, though. Mm -hmm. And performed is definitely the word in this case, not read. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was next level. Definitely. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Maybe oh. there's some questions in the chat. Um, let's see. Doctor is a Dr. Sutton. Oh yeah. Hi, Jenny. Um, that really, you know, that, that was sort of inspired by you. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know the the way those uh, characters like the way you sound with them like I when I read it they sounded like that because like the way it's written is so descriptive and like like I said in the email uh, they the fruit and stuff that they eat like the descriptions of like what they eat and their vegan like rituals uh, 
that really adds to their character. It just it paints such a vivid picture of these people. It's oh. hard not to see them. Well, thanks. Um, I yeah, I definitely have done a lot of research on this topic, as you know. Um, if anyone would like, um, I recently released a zine uh, explicitly against uh, one particular vegan. Um, uh, feel free to contact me if you would like a copy. Man, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that <laughs> one of my like depressive rituals is to just sink into a stupor and watch ton of, tons of YouTube videos. And mm -hmm. I'm sure I'm not alone in that, but like you really capture the very particular like details of watching a YouTube video and the, the way that every one of them is, you know, endorsed or subsidized and they work the plugs in like, like just the cadence of a YouTube video. I think you capture, mm. especially that kind of like very narcissistic sort of YouTube video. I think you captured that. Oh, thank you so very much. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So um, I think if nobody else has any comments or questions, we're going to move on to our last scheduled reader, which is... I have one thing I'd like to say. Sure. It is an absolute accomplishment that you were able to get that deep into that character and to all of those characters, I should say, without putting your head through a wall. Because <laughs> um, I would not be able to do that. <laughs> yeah, I... I don't think, yeah, I don't think I reached a breaking point uh, with uh, hating these characters. You know, I don't think I, I went crazy. Yeah, I, I think that sometimes it's actually more fun or even the most fun to write from the perspective of characters that you like despise. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so anyway, last up is Adam Jeffrey. Are you here, here Adam? I am. Hey, so just before you start, um, we're going to have an open mic period right after you're done. So if anyone's interested in reading during the open mic period, if you could just put something in the chat saying you'd like to read, Rudy's going to be watching the chat and he'll uh, let me know after you're done who's up next. Okay, great. Fun. All right, yeah, I just uh, want to thank Rudy and William for um, letting me do this. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm. Uh, I'm not published. These aren't. Well, this one isn't published. Nothing I've written has been published. So I. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, this one is called uh, "Pretty Cursive." Uh, my school was going to do the Wolfman as a play, because Mr. Brogan said he needed to spice things up because no one ever came to our school plays. I had seen the old movie and I thought I would be the best for the role of the fortune teller gypsy because I already had the costume that my grand made me for Halloween. She made a green turban for me and a long dress with lots of layers and colors. She gave me the prettiest rings and beads to wear with it too. I have a good memory and I thought I would be able to learn what I needed to say in the play fast and easy. Dad said I'm a chatterbox, which means I can talk loud enough for people to hear. And also I thought I would be the best person to play the fortune teller gypsy because my gram taught me scrying and tarot. Because of these things, I knew that I was the best choice for the role of the fortune teller gypsy in the Wolfman play. I tried out in my dress and I brought my crystal and my tarot cards. Mr. Brogan said he liked my props and I told him they weren't props. I acted the lines they told me to act. Mom made me look old and wise with mascara and eyebrow pencil. I knew I did a good job because I lost track of time and when I was done, I felt like I do when I wake up from a dream. Cotton in my ears, gauze over my eyes and warm in my arms. But they didn't give me the part of the fortune teller gypsy. They gave it to Nicole who got her dress from a Halloween shop she didn't know what scrying or tarot were, but she wore star stickers on her cheeks and lipstick. Nicole is far prettier than me. My dad said I was a sore sport for not going to see the play. That didn't make me feel better. To talk to my grandma about it, I lit the candle and held the pencil real loose in my hand over the piece of paper. 
my gram has pretty cursive. I told my gram I didn't get the part and she asked me what the cards and crystals said. I told her the same thing they always told me about myself. She told me it must be true then. She said people will always be embarrassed by how much heart I have, that people are ashamed when they see a little girl with more heart than they'll ever have. She said the world will always be scared of the real deal. I watched the Wolfman movie again. I decided that Lon Chaney Jr. wasn't a good actor. I could see him sweat through his makeup from liquor and not the stage lights. I could tell he was thinking about his dad. That's it. Wow. <laughs> that that bit, hit fucking hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. Seriously. That was sick, dude. That was really good. <laughs> really good. I appreciate the kind words. Thank you. Oh, well, uh, you know what, though? They're not kind. They're, they're realistic. You know what I mean? <laughs> there's, you know, there's something about being nice. About... Fuck yeah. You know what I mean? It's not about being nice. It's uh, yeah. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Just, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think that is, pre- is it's really hard to write from a child, to, especially an emotional mm. piece from a child's perspective and have it be like legitimately evocative of that kind of moment in your life and not feel like maudlin or like like bathos or something, you know? And you really nailed it there. It's a very, it's a very challenging tightrope act. Tight rope act. <laughs> and I think you really got it with that piece. I think you really did, honestly. Um, he did 100% and that's one of the hardest things in that it took me a year to even write a short, a short story from my childhood perspective because I was like what do you do do you want it to be like yeah it's just because you're not a child <laughs> like, um, sorry didn't mean to interrupt but I'm just you know I'm, I'm very much uh, taken right yeah, and it's very hard because I think the instinct when you write from a child's perspective is either to be extremely sentimental or to be very or to cut too hard against that and to be kind of like, okay, this is like hard boiled child mode, right? And to write in uh-huh. a way that that actually may not fall into the sentimentality trap, but instead falls into this trap of presenting your child character as if they were an adult, you know, as if they were, Mm. had the same kind of like cognizance of their surrounding and life as an adult would. And I thought that piece very kind of cleverly avoided those two pitfalls. So I really enjoyed it. Definitely. Appreciate it. Thank you guys. Yeah. The whole like, having to lay out like seven reasons really matter of factly to like justify doing anything was just like oh shit I remember like doing that before committing to mm-hmm. anything for like seven years of my life mm-hmm. yeah yeah I kind of um the first whole I mean that really the last sentence I kind of imagine maybe this this woman rereading this essay she wrote as a child and then adding this very last sentence at the end to, because she came back to it and realized kind of like, you know, what this meant to her. After all these years, she watched the Wolfman movie again. And maybe that last sentence was like the more grown up version of her kind of, you know, reassessing that moment, you know. That's kind of how I imagined it, but I don't know. I'm uh, really impressed with the way that you sketched a character who clearly has pretty low self-esteem and doesn't like talking about herself, but we find so much about her anyway. Yeah, yeah, I, I, um, yeah, I, I, I worked with kids for a few years at a school and I paid really close attention to the way they talked to me and I read a lot of their homework and and um, that really helped a lot with um, kind of honing in that 
that voice. Are you drinking a dark and stormy? Uh, I've had two very tall gin and tonics, and then I had a, um, let's see, what is this? A gumball head, three Floyds gumball head. I What's that? I think it's, well, I live in Indiana, and I think this is an Indiana. Oh, shit, okay. Uh, nice. Beer. And then, yeah. and, and then I had a dose of keys. So um, I'm doing all right. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt with that. It's no, just, no. You know what I mean? It's no. like, we're yeah. all, I like that, that we're all from different places. You know, like I'm yeah, from yeah. Canada and some fucking boring bullshit. So I, I like no, this. yeah. No, you, you and I both, yes. <laughs> uh, on a related note to the drinking conversation, I have not been drinking alcohol but I've had like three very large cups of iced tea over the course of this, um, <laughs> oh, this oh, reading, and I have a notorious <laughs> hyperactive metabolism in a very small bladder. So yeah, yeah, I yeah. am going to step away for a minute. Yeah, please do. Uh, before we, uh -oh, before this we is what I'm open waiting mic. for. <laughs> but if you are interested in participating in the open mic, just throw something in the chat. Uh, and we'll get back to that uh, in probably about five minutes or so. I'll be right back. The adults are leaving the room. I love it. <laughs> Don't fall in. Mm. Lots of sleep, post nudes. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Yep. So what's that? You know, I gotta ask. I think I'm probably the only. Um, I think I'm the only Canadian in 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 the room. And, you know, witnessing what's going on in the States. I mean, we're not much better. There are conservatives that are trying to fuck up our system as well. <laughs> what's, the, what, what's the atmosphere among progressive-minded people there? Like, what are you all thinking? What are you, like, like, <laughs> I'm personally disturbed by the idea that, like, people are thinking Biden, like, they're, they're being like, oh, look, the Republicans are voting for Biden, so that means it's good. I'm horrified. That means the United States has two parties, Republican and hardcore Republican, right? Like, what, what are you guys thinking on the ground? I, uh, I saw a t-shirt on Twitter earlier, and it just said, settle for Biden. Yeah. 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 yeah it was totally settle. <laughs> That's, uh, that sums it up. I'm sorry. Maybe it's, maybe it's a dumb question. As Canadians, we're kind of like it's interesting because I mean, it, it, it is a different country, right? But yeah, I don't know. I think um, you know, I the more the more invested you become in the the federal landscape, you you. Uh, tend to turn around and look and see what your neighbors, how your neighbors are doing and how your local community is doing. And I personally, I just think that um, I need to pay more closer attention to, you know, my local community and help help out as much as I can locally and hope that that um, uh, spreads um, further out and inspires others to to participate in their local elections and their local government and uh, local activism. And really, I mean, you feel kind of helpless um, some days and, but you can always, you know, go next door, knock on your neighbor's door and make sure that they're, they're okay and make sure everything's going well. And then hopefully that, you know, trickles down and, uh, they'll check on their neighbors and so on. That's really how I've been dealing with it. Because if you look at it on too large of a scale, it's, um, it's just kind of too heartbreaking. So um, I think if we all just kind of check in with our neighbors and participate locally and do what we can locally, I think that might be the best course of action. Right. Yeah, well said. Yeah, I think that's a yeah, great I, perspective on it. Definitely. Yeah. But also settle for Biden, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess. I mean, it's like don't be yeah, happy don't about it, but settle for Biden. Well, you know what? As you know, what I'm not going to try and do this. I'm not doing this for clout. But we'll say. <laughs> Are you bringing out like a Bernie bag or a Bernie shirt or something? Yeah, I, I, you know, yeah. I, no uh, I, you know, so. no way. Awesome. Yeah. 
It's too bad, you know. He was too old though, and that. But you know, he was too old. <laughs> Everybody's too old. They're all too old. Yeah, uh, but I mean, Bernie's old. been too old for the last thirty years, and he's still yeah. trucking on. So. <laughs> I do think though that one of Trump's best, like, because the thing is with Trump, I mean, if we're to view him as like a as a kind of like a detached kind of postmodern figure, some of his best insults were brought out uh, by Biden. Like his best disses mm-hmm. were towards Sleepy Joe. <laughs> yeah, you know, definitely. When he's elected, he'll be in the retirement home. It was like, yeah, sick burn. Yeah. We still have the debates. I'm so curious. I feel like it's going to be like that last scene in the Animal Farm where you're just like looking between the two of them and they look more and more similar. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's how I imagine they're just going to like start speaking in exact unison and like amplifies the exact same word salad. Oh, man, so, I that's mean, an awesome comparison because. <laughs> I think it's just going to be the verbal equivalent of uh, Peter Griffin and the chicken from Family Guy. Oh, oh, yeah. I'm, sorry that your, I'm sorry that your country has devolved into performance art. <laughs> but, well, let me yeah. tell you, I'm I'm 15 uh-huh. minutes from Canada, and uh, if shit gets bad, I'll just walk across the border. Please come. Please, yeah. please come. Say I you're going know. to Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> so, um... All right, Brilliant. all right. So let's go. <laughs> Trying to reel it back in here a little bit. Uh, how we, we how can, we can cut always... that. We can cut yeah. that. Out. No, no, I'm not. I'm not going to cut anything. <laughs> how how um, did you make that iced tea, William? Well, let's well, go. Off I do. I was thinking that after the open mic, I'd leave this up if people want to like converse and bullshit and all of that. But I do um, want to give anyone who uh, would like to read the chance in the next hour or so. Uh, Rudy, did anyone want to read? I think Tyler did. Did you, Tyler? Yeah, yeah. Yep. All right, who was that? Was it Tyler? Yeah, yeah. Tyler. sorry. Uh, is my mic fucked up? I nope. Didn't really. Nope, okay. Oh, okay. You can hear me? Okay. Yep. All right. Um, well, the entirety of my published fiction has been on misery tourism. Um, I've got a couple stories that I'm not going to touch right now because they've been accepted but not published yet by other outlets. Um, I'd really like to read um, the one that you guys published this week, but it's a little bit long for the tail end of an open mic section. It's like 3,000. Oh, God damn it. Get out of here. Yeah, I know that feel. <laughs> Um, okay, I'll go ahead and read it. I don't know if any of you read this one. It just came out on, um, what was it, yesterday, Tuesday? Right? Oh, yesterday, okay. Yeah. All right, um, so this is called The Ballad of Billy and Dan. And let me just, okay, there it goes. All right. My father was named Charles Bardo. This was not the name he was born with, but it is the name he passed down to me and I treasure it just the same. He was a remarkable man, shrewd and talented, fiercely independent, and as full of good humor and zest for life as any man you ever met. Charles mastered nearly everything he put his hand to. He was a scholar, a tradesman, a merchant, an entrepreneur and a keen student of human nature. And the fact that a man endowed with such gifts ended up on the wrong side of the law only goes to show what a fickle and faithless instrument the law is. One spring, Charles found himself obliged to move house after a series of events that began with the rich man's bruised feelings and ended with strong men tying Charles to a barber stool and setting a fire underneath from which he only narrowly escaped. His search took him to a snoozy little town called Cheerio Gulch, which sat on the edge of a huge prairie encircled by a row of bluffs. The town was nestled in a little crook where the bluffs parted to let a trickling steam stream through. Now what was unusual about Cheerio Gulch was that there were a couple of gods fighting in the sky above it. No one Charles asked could guess how long they'd been fighting, except to note they were already at it when Lewis and Clark first came by. They were Indian gods, and no one living knew their names. 
Founders of Cheerio Gulch had named them Billy and Dan as a private joke on two imbecile stable boys who were always tussling over something. Few had ever laid eyes on Billy and Dan, for the prairie was huge and hazy and only the bravest men could climb up the sheer bluffs on the prairie's edge to where the air was clear enough to make them out. But the signs of their combat were manifest and undeniable. The two gods' huge bodies rolled slowly around one another and blocked out the sun, sometimes for days at a time. The ground in Cheerio Gulch was forever a tremble from the sounds of their footfalls and of the stream of hideous blows they poured over one another. Their movements kicked up huge masses of air and dirt and cloud, and the town had tornadoes and dust storms as often as other towns had rain. Worse still was the sweat shedding off their bodies and the blood streaming in rivulets from huge ragged gashes. The sweat fell to earth as rain, and withered plants and turned groundwater bitter wherever it fell. While the blood had some kind of magic in it that would make food crops grow unusually large and delicious, but leave the soil totally exhausted. And also about one person 80 who ate them would turn into a coyote. As hard as you may find it to live in such a place as Cheerio Gulch, none of the people living there would have it any other way. They swelled with true pioneer gumption when they spoke about it. They were quite proud of themselves for living in the shadow of such beings as most men thought long gone from the earth. Being a daring man himself, Charles admired the townsfolk for this, though he did not share the popular belief that someday soon the fight would end and the winner would climb down to claim his spoils and anoint his spectators with eternal glory. Charles heard all these tales over at Chauncey's saloon while he washed trail dust out of his mouth with a heroic amount of beer. As the evening wore on, he acquired himself with a pretty young creature named Hannah Borgia. Hannah was the 20-year-old, recently orphaned daughter of a local Italian homesteader who worked at the Cheerio Gulch Telegraph office. She would tell Charles over Brandy that she loved her work so much that rather than marry and become a farm wife, as her uncles had insisted, she instead sold her parents' Cheerio farm to a Mexican for one dollar to spite them. It appealed to her fancy, she said, to hear so much news from so many distant and fantastic places. Charles, meanwhile, recognized in hand an opportunity to get the jump on any bounties posted or any armed posses dispatched, which might disrupt his, interrupt his stay in this quiet town. Charles was very attractive to women, even with fresh burns modeling half his face, and he easily seduced the fair Miss Borgia. You may criticize my father for his dishonest motives, uh, but I believe it was a prudent move, and I would do it too if I were in his place. Since selling her property, Hannah had rented a room above the local sockery, and for the next several months, Charles shared it. By night, he showed her carnal blitz beyond her wildest fantasies. By day, he studied her at the telegraph until he was able to operate it and secretly wired several banks to cash out some accounts he'd established for just such an occasion. Nature took its course, and Hannah bore just swelled with child. Charles had dealt with such inconveniences before, and the minute he judged it safe to leave, he gathered all his belongings and rode his horse quietly out of town in the dead of night. But, as poor luck would have it, he sank his horse's hooves into several gopher holes, one after another, injuring it badly enough that he had to put the beast down then and there. He performed this task with the butt of his rifle to avoid the possibility of a gunshot waking somebody up. He hadn't been watching where he was going, he realized, because he was too deep in thoughts of Hannah. He leaned against his dead horse and contemplated her in the cool light of the moon. He had known many women, but none like her. In beauty and wit and spirit, she was every inch his equal, and Charles' heart leapt with a strange desire to give up his rambling ways and start an honest life with her. Scarcely believing what he was doing, he ran back to Cheerio Gulch on foot, and in the beatific light of the rising sun, he knelt and asked the bewildered Hannah Borgia to be his wife. Hannah was amenable to marrying Charles, told him she wouldn't do it unless they stayed in Cheerio Gulch. Charles was dumbstruck could not bear the thought of raising children amid such danger. Only a week before, 
one of the town's frequent tornadoes had leveled the peanut emporium, scattering peanut shells and mangled limbs across half the roofs in town. Hannah listened stone-faced to his objections. She insisted that Cherio Gulch was her home. Lost my place there. Okay, there we go. She insisted that Cherio Gulch was her home, and a wanderer like Charles would never understand the deep connection she felt to it. They quarreled bitterly, and more than once, Charles got on a horse to leave again, but he always came galloping back. Finally, he resigned himself to Hannah's wishes. He vowed, however, that before his child arrived, he would turn Cheerio Gulch into a place fit for children, and this meant stopping the brawl in the sky by any means necessary. This seemed to him an easier task than parting with such a prize of a woman as Hannah. All the townsfolk thought Charles a nut, but he was a most resourceful man, and there was hardly a town between here and San Francisco where no one owed him a favor. He telegraphed one Dr. Harmon Genial, who some years back had gotten into a misunderstanding with two Indian boys, for which Charles had selflessly taken the blame to avoid a violent incident. Dr. Genial taught at a Mormon university and was an expert in atmospheric phenomena, which I suppose you could call these gods, but his main value to Charles was that he was an accomplished balloonist. Charles wired a letter and some money to Dr. Genial. And several weeks later, a train unloaded at Cheerio Station, bearing Dr. Genial, several balloons of various makes, and a team of hired laborers. The fat and accommodating Dr. Genial gave Charles some lessons, and in quite a short time, my peerless father was piloting his own balloon. The appointed day came, and the whole town gathered outside to watch his team of six balloons rise into the sky in pairs. Anna stayed inside, for she was in the final days of her condition, and she feared her constitution would not bear the sight of her beloved putting himself in danger. Up rose the balloons, shrinking to tiny balls, then seeds, then disappearing entirely from the view of the townsfolk. My father rose above a cloud canopy, and there in front of him were Billy and Dan, fighting just as ferociously as if they'd just begun. Neither carried any weapon, simply punching and blocking and grasping barehanded with fists like small islands. They were brown as old leather and looked like Indians, except they were hairier than any Indian Charles had ever seen, with ape-like coats of thick black hairs covering their limbs and trunks. They were naked as jaybirds, and the team had to move quick and sure to avoid the swinging of the god's male members, which were huge, even when their overall size was taken into account. Stretched between each pair of balloons was a long alpenhorn, so heavy and awkward, the bell had to rest in one balloon's basket and the mouthpiece in another. It was Charles' idea to use these horns to amplify their voices, which otherwise would never reach a giant's ears. The party took up positions a good distance away, and Charles began to call out through his alpenhorn. Billy and Dan took no notice and continued swinging their mountainous fists at one another. Charles called louder, and the other two horns joined in. For the briefest moment, both gods swung around to face Charles, and he fancied he saw them both lock eyes in understanding. Without warning, Dan swung his hips around, and from a distance that Charles would have judged impossible, obliterated the two balloons with the head of his titanic cock. The tip of the organ struck the alpen horn square on, and though it had taken half a dozen men to lift the horn, it whirled away like a stick thrown to a dog. Both of the balloons carrying it were wrecked. The two baskets remained intact, but without support plummeted to earth. Thinking quickly, Charles grabbed Dr. Genial by his neck and maneuvered the portly scholar beneath to break his fall. Once on the ground, Charles rushed over to the place where the Alpenhorn had landed and found a sight that would untether him from his wits. A huge instrument had through unimaginable misfortune fallen on the very building where Hannah was awaiting his safe return. The whole sockery was crushed and socks of every size and color lay in a pile, which was slowly turning red in the middle. 
The heavy bell had fallen directly on Hannah, and her entire body, from the waist up, was smashed into a jelly. Everything Charles had ever hoped for was gone in an instant. One of the remaining balloon pairs had landed to assess the damage. Mad with grief, Charles threw all the men out of the balloon's basket with the strength of a gorilla, dove inside, and rose up into the air again. The baskets contained an assortment of firearms and explosives, which the team had planned to use to get, to get the god's attention if the horns failed. A berserk Charles moved the balloon close to the gods, picked up one of the rifles, and began firing wildly. It is unlikely that they suffered any more hurt than you may get from a mosquito bite. But Charles kept on firing, reloading, firing, reloading. He cared not one whit for his own life. His only pursuit was to visit a fraction of the hurt he felt onto those gods. Finally, having fired all his ammunition, Charles lit a bundle of TNT and heaved it, head, heaved it in Billy's face with all his might. The explosion did not harm Billy at all, but the great flash and noise distracted him long enough for Dan to make a decisive blow. There was a hideous snap as bowed and teeth came apart, and the side of Billy's face pushed inward like a bruised apple. Blood flew through the air in mile-long arcs, and the great god's body fell, annihilating Charles' balloon, tumbling through the clouds and flattening Cheerio Gulch. There were still a few people gathered outside, and they crowded around Billy trying to catch the words he was mumbling under his breath. But no one could identify, let alone understand, his language. Blood pooled beneath his ruined face and softened the dirt underneath until the townspeople's shoes began sinking in it. His eyes darted. His chest heaved up and down. He gave a violent shudder and died. And as he did so, his bowels Bowels cracked open with an explosion of foul yellow shit that swept away all that was left of Cheerio Gulch. I should mention now that I never knew a word of this story until several years ago. Hannah's lower parts ended up in the river and rode a flood of excrement downstream. Somewhere along the way, my mother's lifeless organs somehow began to birth me, and I finally came into the world washed up on a riverbank between my mother's legs like Moses among the bulrushes. A young Mexican boy fetching water for a nearby Jesuit mission rescued me. I was taken in and raised by these godly men with no clue of my heritage. When the boy erupted in melon-sized boils and died from waiting in god shit, I took his place as soon as I could carry a bucket. From that day on, I was their especial slave. I cooked, I swept, I scrubbed, I fetched water, I lit candles, I brought books, I rang bells, and I stood sentry while they mumbled their interminable litanies. These men of God, these paragons of mercy and righteousness, thought me a demon because of the manner of my birth and treated me worse than the meanest beast with insults and whippings from dawn till dusk. I bore these horrors without breaking, I grew hard and strong with work, and the stronger I grew, the harder they had to beat me to keep me in line. I taught myself to read in the library, acquainting myself with both the sacred scriptures and the profane and heretical literature confiscated by the priests. The more I learned, the harder they tried to keep me ignorant. I grew into quite a handsome child, owing to my fine stock, and once this became evident, I suffered the priestly fool's perversions also. I submitted to their pawings when I had to. When I could land a blow or bite some area they wouldn't want to show to a doctor, I did so. I escaped many times, and each time it took them longer to find me, and each time they hung heavier fetters on me, which my muscles grew to accommodate. Often they would threaten to kill me if I proved too much trouble, and in this way I made peace with death early on. One day, however, the mission was struck by a series of booms and earthquakes, and the priests went outside to investigate. They soon found themselves in the deep, dark well of a giant shadow. It was Dan, the god from the sky, though I did not know him as such at the time. In a clear voice and with good English, Dan demanded that the child within their walls be released. The priests refused to obey orders from the devil, so Dan knelt and began tearing the roof off the mission one wing at a time. I knelt hidden in the vestibule, 
and watched rapt through the window as Dan picked up the priests one by one and ground them between his fingers. Eventually, the men relented, fetched me from my hiding spot, and pushed me outside, at which point Dan stood up and swept the whole building away with his foot like he might do to an anthill. The great god knelt again and leaned his shoulder to touch the ground. A man I had never met before climbed down to meet me. He didn't look young or old. His face was darkened with much sun and eroded into sharp edges by work and weather, but it did not sag or crack as old men's faces do, and he still had the twinkling eyes and easy grin of a boy. The patches of old bubbled skin from long ago burns only added to his good looks. The man introduced himself as Charles Bardot. He did not mention he was my father, but I somehow knew. Charles apologized for his delay in coming to collect me, but he had only recently discovered I was alive. He himself had survived by diving out of the balloon's basket and clinging to the coarse ropes of hair on Billy's shoulders. Once Billy was dead, Dan descended to earth, just as the people of Cheerio Gulch had said he would, and he sought out my father. He said he was in my father's debt. Thanks to him, his enemy was dead and all his lands and dominions surrendered. Now, with so few gods left, he wished to expand his realm and offered my father a place at his right hand. All my life, my father said, I have suffered at the cruel whims of a sick society which persecutes men of talent and vision. Never in all my days have I lived in peace. Always mu I must endure the abuses of men many times my lesser. I understand you have suffered something the same, and I am deeply sorry. The world has no use for us, he concluded, and I see nothing for it but to clear the whole rot tear the whole rotted thing out and start anew. My father did not even need to ask me if I wanted to join him. We understood one another perfectly as only men of our sort can do. With a broad wave, he ushered me into a spot on Dan's shoulder where I might grab hold and sit and together we rose into the sky and rode across the prairie toward our shared destiny. That's it. I, I, I really love that. And <laughs> I'm gonna tell you what I really love about it. When it really, it really perfectly captures like both the absurdity and the obscenity of the American tall tale or yeah. of like these American folkloric yeah. heroes which is something that I feel like a lot of times when people try to like um, create a piece that's kind of folkloric in nature or that's kind of trying to capture the sense of a legend or a tall tale, they'll kind of, you know, balderize them, I guess you would say, or try to modernize mm -hmm. them. And mm -hmm. they take all of the like really nasty bits out. And I think, <laughs> and I think there's something- oh, yeah, Those guys are freaks. Like just absolute dirty savages. <laughs> just completely <laughs> unsanitized about that, that I really think in some ways captures the magic of reading one of those stories and also mm. like the like kind of taboo nature of like reading one of those stories from like a book as a kid and getting to the part and being like, oh shit, like, <laughs> oh, you can put this in books, you know? Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah no, I have something, I mean, I have something basically similar to say in that um, I feel like that captures the uh, the Paul Bunyan plus a little bit of Ren and Stimpy-ness of, uh, of old <laughs> tall tales. <laughs> and that they, the Ren and Stimpy kind of, when I was a kid, that felt sort of forbidden and off limits. I think my mom actually came in one time when I was watching it and she said, that that's retarded, turn that off. You know, so it was, <laughs> it was, it was really kind of like a forbidden Thing, but that's that is the experience that I got like uh, William said from reading tall tales for the first time it's like wow they can they somebody printed this and this is like in a book like oh <laughs> but no it's it, it's definitely awesome thank you yeah it reminds me I haven't read much of um, uh, Charles Portis are you familiar with Charles Portis oh yeah the guy who wrote uh, the novel True Grit right yeah 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 yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, there's something about uh, your language and your voice that reminds me of, of his work um, and it's just like 
so and you know like comforting and enveloping and like just like you have so much confidence and in the voice and you just want to go along with the 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 speaker wherever he takes you um so yeah it was lovely it was very thank great you. thank you mm -hmm. great uh rudy who's up next oh. oh sorry um it looks like that's the end of the queue but if somebody wants to jump in now i said i'll i'll read oh. something but if only if somebody there's nobody wants to jump in. There's only one thing that uh, people had said I should read and I didn't read, but I, I would love to hear what you have to read. But if there is time for one quick poem. Oh, you can jump in before me. Absolutely. It's just one. And I'm sorry, you're going to have to. It's people told me that because it's basically it's the. Um, I, I don't want to be that person, but it, it's basically someone told me uh, read this uh tonight and then i didn't so if i can find it i would like to and then if i can't then uh i would love to acquiesce sure absolutely um while you're looking for it i do see bibles and um vicky have both said that they're interested in reading so maybe if yeah. you want to read your short poem and then sure Bible. I, found, I just found it. So do you want me to go before or after? Yeah, it? I do. you said it would be quick. So you can go yeah. and then if Bibles is here, he can go next and then we'll cool. Is that all right? Sounds Should good. Go? Cool. Uh, swimming with dog sharks. There is an Asian man on the subway. He likes swimming with dog sharks. I know this because I just overheard him say to his friend, I like swimming with dog sharks, he said. It's nice. He said, I have never been swimming with dog sharks. It is a regret I didn't realize I had. I don't even know what a dog shark looks like. I picture a German shepherd underwater. It is gliding towards me with fangs exposed. The dog shark has tiny fins and they are wagging frantically like so many tails. I should have asked the Asian man what dog sharks look like. If only I could picture them better and relay the details to you. If I was ever in the water with you and saw one, I could say, look, there's a dog shark. My knowledge of dog sharks would totally impress. I hope nobody asks any follow-up questions about dog sharks. I guess I'll just search dog sharks on the internet, but it's not the same. I often eavesdrop. It's something I can't help but I'd never overheard anyone talking about dog sharks before. So I really should have asked that Asian man on the subway. I should have asked him about dog sharks. I think I would have learned something. How was that? Great. I love slice of life pieces like that. You know, they just capture a moment and then, yeah. <laughs> just like perfectly capture a moment in time. It was from, it was recorded on a BlackBerry in like 2011 or something. So I'm glad oh. I did it. I guess. Yeah. Oh, oh, I see Bibles. Hey. Yes. Hey, did you want to read? <laughs> yeah, I'll see it. if I can make this. Let's see from if I can make it work. Okay, the floor is yours. Awesome. <laughs> Isn't it Taurus? Okay, hold on. What? Is it the Ford Taurus? What is the? Uh... How do you know it was a Ford? <laughs> <laughs> it's a uh, Ford Focus. Uh, <laughs> so. Sorry, I don't know. <laughs> That's good. Good job. Okay, hold on. Let me see if I can pull them up here. Okay. I'm going to try to read these two uh, pieces that I have published previously on Modeling House a while back. So this one's called um, a syrupy slide and I'll try to get you the links um, after. Yeah, that'd so, be um, Okay. A short stack of thick pancakes, thigh high rump pumpers, sloshing white whipped butter into my syrupy reflection, helping me digest my wife's words regarding it being a good thing in fact that cats had such a long line. My French toast being good enough to relate to the passerby comments on the place being overrated 
the line here is so much less, I say, and coffee on tap. We do better in diners anyways, not trying to prove anything to anybody. But let me tell you, my accomplishments are worth toasting over. To which she agrees, saluting me into the nearest liquor store and buying me a bottle's worth of Rittenhouse, which I picked out before tossing three ibuprofen into my head, which was on course to painful sleepiness. The sky, a shredded chuck of cotton candy, catches against the door, tearing space between the stars and sucking time into the void. The shadow realm becomes me as I knock my feet through the sidewalk, floating in the disconnect. I reach the key of myself back into my pocket and turn back towards my true life lived in death. Home again. I'm coming, though I cannot go. My feet spinning scenery around the puzzle at my core. Let them be the way they are, says the wind. There are things you don't need to think about. There is a pain in your muscles loosened by taking a back seat to matriarchies, minorities, sexual preferences, and political ideologies. The clatter is of the earth. You are the cream of the crop, says my dad quietly over his shoulder. And you are loved, says Una, which is more than most can say. A smoothing tide of coursing music washes over the plaque in my bones, eroding my spirit into the scene where I can be the room. My thoughts painting the walls with my dreams, which are roaming beyond my ears in flocks of noise draining into the pillow. The mattress half cocked against the curb, a raft through the trash into the mountain's maw. A cold wind turns the whiskey into a 15 year scotch that was bottled back in 2001. That's all the way back into my freshman year of high school, back before my first drop down in Mexico, which was paired with the cigar's first smoke to touch my lungs, back before vaping was possible, before my first cigarette. Such a sneaky kid, always floating away. First it was my family, then my friends, into the arms of my wife, and now away from her as I'm sneaking away into the only place that I can get myself to sneak to these days, the internet, or shall I better say, the we of us. Fuck yeah. Thanks. This one's another one, and it's called Leaks in the Lease. The apartment is out of bread and milk. There is leftover barbecue in the fridge. The barbecue keeps me from going to the grave. Staring out the window, I watch the bow crest the New York horizon. There is cannon fire on the shelves. The Holy Ghost in my pocket. My captain's chair a full power recliner, who needs a desk these days, all the way back, and into my dreams, to the future. Milk, cereal, bread, come on Bibles, we know you're still alive. Don't try to fool us, what are you planning? How are you going to get through this? How are you supposed to stay relevant? Shattered segments of my true self, reclining further into the dream, the illusion of my future, the delusions of grandeur. Get up, says the voice. We all know you can do this, but all the same, further back I recline. It's my gallbladder, I say. You really can't hold it against me. That should have gotten us on her insurance by now, but she hasn't. The only medicine I've got is rest and relaxation. Ragamuffin ain't fit to live. Undereducated white boy ain't fit to lead. The revolution's already underway. You missed your seat on the wheel. Again, it rolls over you, into the future, into your dreams. So lie back, relax. The time is not now. I don't know what time it is. I've got friends in low places. I'm not going anywhere. We all died in that plane crash. I still don't have a Chromebook. I'm still using my wife's. I'm looking at porn, daddy's daughter swapping, anything to bring the soul to the surface. Bread, milk, cereal, the further recline, my phone's not even plugged in. There is no hope for the hopeless, but that's the New York City rhythm. It rings through my sleep. The bell is tolling, but it's a joke, a trap. Scorpios don't have the easiest lives. I've got to plug the phone in, but I don't need video games. I've got to do my own thing. I've got to stay light in this life. It's the only way I'll heal. Leave them all behind. See the trials of life for what they are. Onward and forward into Hosanna, the Latter-day Saints, the salvation of art. I thought I'd be better by now, but I just can't seem to get there. Finding myself concerned with things that don't matter not finding my voice to be my own, saying things that people want to hear. There is adventure everywhere, and I'm reclining deeper into the dream, talking about the act of writing rather than reading my writing live on stage. Life is a balancing act. You should really try to keep doing what's right. That's what I keep telling myself, but I've got to let this phone charge for a bit, and I've got my parents' cable password now. So recline and sink back. Don't you think you've done enough? Don't you think you deserve this? You're as dead as a doorknob. 
why have you still not given up yet? Deadwood comes on. The dream of the West. Welcome to my world. I'm just trying to survive. Bread, milk, cereal, leftover barbecue in the fridge, work tomorrow. I'm glad, you didn't, I'm glad you didn't read earlier because you're better than everyone who read. <laughs> that, that would have upstaged me, but you know, I'm, I'm glad. It's a, it's a, it's a delayed That's, thing. I read, I thought it was pretty good. <laughs> you did it, but you know, it's, delayed. it's nice. It's a delay. Come on. No, no, that was no. But that was great. I'll say that was great. And we'll make it about, I, get, yeah, get out of the Ford. Get it the automobile. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Yeah, no, I love, I love, you know we always love your shit. It's spectacular. Yeah. I love, I love your the cadence of the I second. I will one. someday finish your book. <laughs> yeah. It's all right. No need. <laughs> I think I'm two thirds of the way great. through now. Awesome. Thanks, guys. I really love how you your knack for giving your sentences such tonal left turns, how you're going from something so conversational then wild metaphysical images and then right back again. Yeah, that's just kind of how I see kind of life going in my head, I guess, a little bit. Yeah, I was going to kind of mention that, that it almost sounds like a sermon, like a part, part sermon, part like, I don't know, like, you know, Twitter post or something. <laughs> It's, it's awesome. Yeah, I love Twitter posts too, by the way. <laughs> we talked a little about church histories and stuff in the past, and mm -hmm. maybe that plays a little bit of a part in that. Yeah, yeah Bible, thank you so much for, uh, um, you know, uh, sh coming out of the coming out of the shadows. Um, <laughs> I loved it. Um, Thanks. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I got a bit of a McClanahan vibe, but I'm worried as a Canadian, it's just kind of like me being like, oh, American is not American, you know? Hello. Hi. Thanks, guys. And here he is, like, walking. Where are you going, Bibles? <laughs> oh, I gotta it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a heat store. He's reading masterpieces, and he's, like, walking to the fucking post office or something. He's <laughs> a man on the move. <laughs> it's all part of the mystery, right? <laughs> yeah. so, I don't know. I don't know how I'm that mysterious, honestly. I'm out here wide <laughs> in the open, reading very personal works. It is very sunny where you are. Sun, <laughs> sun shining bright on my face. You can see every spot, every pore. Oh, very beautiful. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Yeah, I've got to go so now. Bibles. Sure. Hello. And also thank you for your service in terms of the podcast that you've been doing. When are you going to drop another oh, yeah. episode of that, by the way? Uh, when I have time. I'm trying <laughs> to do like a weekly thing, yeah. but yeah. sometimes it lags a little. Yeah, I really enjoyed the other one, the one we were on, and also all the other ones. Of course. Favorite yeah. podcast to do is just leave messages on yours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, I got to go now. See you, see you man. Hey, my yeah. Thanks, bye. So, uh, Vicky, I think Vicky's up next, and then I want to get Rudy in here, and then Adam had a short piece, I think. So, are you are you with us, Vicky? Cool. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, nice. It kind of sounds like a sound. I, uh, okay, Vicky, you put a link in the chat. Um, oh, I, she, maybe she's hey. trying to get her mic. Oh, here we go. Yeah, uh, can you all hear me well? Can hear you yeah. perfectly. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, this entire thing was written like uh, during the duration of this call. I felt like that would be an interesting thing to do. Oh, wow. Oh, hey, awesome. Holy shit. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. That's an awesome idea. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's Quine Q Spiritual. Q stands for Quine Q Spiritual, you know, the Benoit B. Mandelbrot joke. I don't know. <laughs> um, you'll, you'll notice a lot of phonetic patterns. Uh, should I just go? 
Oh yeah, sorry. It's the floor is yours. Okay, cool. Hypothetical person typing writing implicit stories about possible situations suspended in esoteric worlds, closed in taciturn, subjunct infinitive verbs, spliced, diced in participle by the slice, sliding five faults, casting glossolalic dice, priceless patterns, in divine primes, defining divinations of number line, enumerating words entwined between spiral spines, duplicitating chiral quines, silicon autocopy expressed in Ariadne's line, multi-threading back pain through sextuplet helicals, helping hopelessly to unfritter, inspire free radicals in catacombs and hecatombed mind, nuked on pyre, equivalent ex exchange inscribed in Mephistophelian merchants accumulating capital of eternal Heracletian fire, cosmocron illogical flux, flumed through grandiose conduit, attired in styles pilfered pewter-like from liturgical demiurge, semiotizer, heroschismic jinxjunctive syllogisms, dripping gists enclosed inside gin shots and almond mind, imbuing bitch with principle of sufficient liquidity, leveraging reasons, tripping transcendentally over pneumatic cables. It seems that I'm ain't never been the same since concussive bang and blow seems I've been clanging all same like and in the same sense time communicating between unlanguage, same sense each time and I'm and I'm each time, each time, each time, each time, but who's the I'm? who's glitzing out, imperious mind of mine, periodico-platonic eidos tic tac out simulacral thoughts rhythmed in rhyme, decadental principalities, spread about labyrinthine, minotaur part in echo la 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 uh, la prophesizal, lilting wilt while off inflections of Mido's tongue, but I transubstantiate alchemy in the mirror, dehiscent dipshit, stoned philosopher, and for you get a grip, or grit molars against dying out in tetanic teeth grind. The bread body and great blood I broke and decanted to your lips from mine is not but piles of shit. Holy fuck. How the hell did you write wow. that in like <laughs> just the, in the course of time that you, you know that the, the reading has been taking place? God damn. Um, <laughs> that was a roller coaster ride. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's sleep deprivation in Adderall. Uh, <laughs> Nothing but the classic. Wow, that's amazing! And some of the uh, yeah, that was some incredible. of the tongue twisters <laughs> are so the the rhyme it it feels so this rhyme scheme. I don't know what the rhyme scheme is. I'm not even going to pretend to to understand it, but it feels <laughs> so. It has a cadence. It's so like enrapturing and kind of like just it just sucks you in. Kind of, it's really weird. Thank you. Yeah, you managed to um, convey maybe what uh, a mind was processing while listening to uh, listening to a story. It's kind of what I felt like. It's, it's really nice. Yeah. That's a oh. project too, because you made us all muses. Kind of. You can definitely hear like yourself riffing and improvising. It's kind of jazz like. Yeah. It's kind of like a scatting kind of cadence. Yeah. Yeah, it's scatting kind of... is a really interesting yeah. like comparison, yeah. I think. Like it really does have that kind of like it feels improvisational, but also like the like level of like wordplay and I guess you'd almost say sound play going on here is wild given how yeah. especially like I'm fucking blown away that this was written as quickly as it was you know <laughs> uh, I really really this is fucking good <laughs> thank you it sounds like it was just the sound of what's going on in your head and you just dropped the needle on it you know and started yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> Also, I don't mean to be inappropriate, but orange is a great color on you. Uh, <laughs> on me? <laughs> I <laughs> no comment. No, I'm not gonna. No I, don't, I just need a comment. Let's move. Let's move on. Okay. Okay. Good. 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 Um, anyway, oh, up wait. next, uh, <laughs> was there? Rudy, was there someone after Vicky besides you? I know. 
Adam uh, wanted to kind of get back in here, and we will get him yeah. back in here. But if Adam, if you want to jump in next with your uh, your poem there, Adam, yeah, I can. It's really quick. Um, I'll get it out of the way, and then you guys can wrap things up. Um, uh, it's called uh, "Roll Her in Flower." Um, we caught her like a pole in China with rope. She screamed and got hoarse quick. We stripped her to her bare ass using Leland's knife. Badass buck antler handle. Keith brought the bags of flour. We dumped the bags all over her. We threw fists of flour at her naked body. We stayed back at first, but when we threw the flour, it went to smoke in the wind, so we had to get closer so the flour would cover her really good. She never cried. After she was good and flowery, we cut her loose and told her to get going. She started to run home. It was a joke she had coming, but none of us laughed because it was the most beautiful sight we'd all seen. The biggest girl in the world, running. Flower comes smoking off her like a ghost, turning back into a real person. We rolled her in the flower to find her wet spot. And that's the end. Wow. Well, that's very cool. Yeah. There's another, like your other piece, there's real, like, a real high level of control going on in your prose that I really appreciate. Like, it's very carefully balanced. So that it evokes emotion without being like, without beating you over the head with it, I guess you would say. So, yeah, I really enjoyed that. Um, yeah, like the short shortness of the form, I guess, really, you pack a lot into into that, into those 160 words. I mean, that's pretty great. I mean, it's, yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, I love oh sorry. No, 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 that's all I've got. So, Rudy, it's all you now. All right. Um, first of all, does anybody else want to jump in or two? I mean, after you, sure. Why, why not? I'll do like a short thing if that's okay. But Rudy, okay. Or do, or we can cool. do a game. Awesome. Um, I'm going to link the piece here. This one might be a little weird to read out loud so i'm going to link it here and this is called 52 card pickup let's pull it up here the siege of old gabe's tower lasted about 10 adult fist time plus two adult fingers shoved into you by a lonely dude who came over from the next trench claiming he was a Spaniard, which I heard is a type of hairy trench dwelling orc, any land and underground. The morning it began, Artie in small arms and breathy death screams were performing a noise rock concept album entitled Fuck You. After the bangs stopped ringing in my head, not the finger bangs, I went down below ground level and cried in, in front of Lance Corporal Turok which was not a war crime because the chain of command was essentially liquid by that point. I'm not responsible, is what I think I said, or something that looked stupid. He shrugged and saluted, but didn't hug me. I almost ordered him to, but remembered that that would be a war crime. Everybody was playing poker that day in the trench as usual. The fucking new guy didn't know poker somehow, and I had to explain it. Hold three cards in your hand, don't show any. No, draw them from the deck, Draw doesn't mean color on them, and I wouldn't let the brass catch you doing that anyway. It just means take three without showing or looking. If you got any that look like people, no, don't show them to me. We're playing. Those trump when everybody else shows. Better looking ones trump more. Taught about the garbage cards, the ones with copies of dumb symbols on them, and how you just count the symbols up and that's their name. Five shovels on the card is five shovels, etc., etc. I'm a lieutenant, so it was my job to count all the garbage cards higher than five. They trusted me. Most, mostly garbage and numbers didn't matter because you look for the prettiest, dumbest, scariest faces, and those win. The other thing about the cards is that they were orders. 
Grunts don't know which are which, but Command, mostly shiny brass, uses them to form up squads to do things somehow. It's literally all on the cards, this battle, this whole war. For you Winopedias out there, this is widely disputed, but fuck, I believe it. Fucking new guy showed scary hairlip woman along with two garbage, nine hearts, nine shovels, his second game. I read the garbage ones as sevens because everyone says nines for shadow over the top. When you go over the top, you die because the trench is surrounded from all sides by rebels. I called them as sevens because I thought it might save him. It didn't. Within five fist time, he was shot through the eye by a sniper while waiting on the first level. He was going to get sent over the top. I know it. Turok said the bullet that killed him looked like a nine. I don't really know what that was supposed to mean. Every night, this old woman from Mong Company comes in and collects all the cards. She's one of McNamara's morons. A trainable designated live fire mitigation bullet sponge. But I've never seen her go into the field. She just picks up the cards every night and every morning they're shuffled and back on the table in number five mess. If there's any bent or loss, she lets somebody know right up top know right away. You're punished, and believe me, you will never see it coming. They once hung some ordnance clerk upside down in mess and beat him like a pinata for marking a five. <coughs> they unfucked the five with some crayons, but told us to rape him, and we got in line while a bloody bra brass stood watch. We all had to do it. That is, until the brass left to do war fighting stuff. There were like four of us still lined up at that time. Clerk's face was all runny, camouflage mascara, dirt, sewage, cement. We didn't have to at that point, I guess. On the X day of the siege, where X is a day that both me and at least one other person would remember the same way, Shiny yelled at Bloody Brass so much that the walls shook. When Shiny Brass dims the sky to bombard the field grades with hurtful word flechettes, you know it's serious. They said pretty much that their headcanon for this siege defense was too wishfully indulgent and masturbatory. There was even a shakeup in the high command, which resulted in lesser shinies being recalled, reneged, refactored, or whatever you call it when big hat generals get shuffled around. Patton shouldn't be shipped with Montgomery, said the loudspeaker in the sky, because Patton is a stone butch and Monty is a lipstick femme, and that's aesthetically poo-poo. Anyway, that noon, a bloody brass colonel around the corner grabs me by the hair and drags me through number one trench and into the big pig slops that are low traffic entrance to the officer's mess. A muscle hellbound guy with thick sideburns, leather trench coat, mustache, hugely decorated truncheon. Big mood is Stonewall. Jackson, maybe. He was from Furanem, a place that's supposed to be only, quote, Steers and queers, unquote, and he wasn't no minotaur, so I wasn't afraid of him raping me at first. You're a tomboy looking bitch, he said after a minute. Then I was. He opens the door to the officer's mess, punts me in, then points to the set of cards on an ammo box. I salute. Don't, he says, eyeing the cards. You look like my son, he blurts out sincerely, an opener for a conversation that's about as comprehensible to me as a Roy Lothez is to a fucking Mong playing chess. He died on level three this morning. It was about your age. Who boy. At first, at fist, a fist later, I'm walking upwards direction in level one trench. Cards are in my pocket. I have a rucksack too. Don't know who put it on me. My esteemed comrade, Private Jester, hops out from somewhere. First time she's been in my way all this morning. All this where are you going shit. Tell her that a bloody wants me to do something. She's talking with her hands and putting them in my face. I push her head into the wall. Bye, Jester. She lingers at least another fist. By this time, we're in the shadow of the tower. It's pitch black except for outgoing from the spires, rockets, and bystanders. Seconds between bursts, and the bystanders aren't screaming yet, so they must be putting them far downfield to serve White Foss, the most complacent rebel scum. Jester tugs on my arm. When I turn around to slugger, it's just me with no skin, and that all skeletons are. I trudge forward, ignoring the rattles. I get to the elevator. I find the floor that looks like a snake, just like the bloody brass said. Call elevator, waiting. I see people going over the top on level one, but just that, no details. Bing. The operator skeleton asks what literary device I'm hauling. I shrug, and he gives me the evil eye. He has no eyes, no face. I'm just angry personifying. 
butterflies. Speak up, he says, and I stutter out my understanding of my orders. Must be alliteration, he laughs. Snake? Nod. Snake floor is all green fuzzy carpet. Some hierarchs are up here talking acceptable casualties and throwing around the name of my favorite thrash metal band, like grunts talk about who fucked her. Same chortles between sentences, same buddy confirmation. <laughs> Pretty much everyone in Sector 8. <laughs> I mean, am I right? I know where to go somehow. Horizontal black boxes encroach from above and below. Cut scene. Don't look over there. I see myself in third person. In old Gabe's very private occult study, I take out the deck. I now know which are which for fleeting seconds. <clears throat> Her voice is nine inch nails on a chalkboard. Hold the deck out in front of you, sweetheart. You're the one reading this aloud, you literate asshole. But I'm sure she doesn't sound anything like you. I follow orders. She slaps the cards out of my hands. I gasp and look down. They're all scattered over the, they're scattered all over the floor. I'm in a bubble bath, candles, grooming supplies, music she thinks I like. I ask if the water is too hot. I'm asked if the water is too hot, too cold. She touches me somewhere and asks, what prompted that? Does it again somewhere lower? What caused that? It's explained to me that time is like water and my feelings in this bathtub right now. Continuity isn't a thing. No order to events, just shit happening all at once. Simultaneously. Like those video games that are most fun because you and friends can play and experience them together. All of this because of the pile of cards on the floor. Don't yell. Don't look out that window. She puts my uniform back on me. 52 card pickup, she beams, like she's my age and she's playing a friendly joke instead of trespassing like a weird-ass crone. I start picking the damn cards up, stacking them into a deck. She bends down and helps, singing a bastardized version of that Mary Poppins song about how work is freedom. I feel like we don't quite get it right the first time, whatever that means. It seems I endure the initial slap on that weird bathtub a bunch of times listening to shitty shoegaze music because that's what 13-year-olds jam to nowadays, like fists for like fists and fists. Finally, she puts the cards back into my pocket and closes the door in my face. Don't touch anything, I hear mumbled through the door, which is 100% typical shiny brass fuck with me shit. You just go ahead and touch something after they told you not to. Just do it. I don't. Skeletons follow me all the way back home, but do the boo thing whenever I turn around. Whatever. I, talk, I walk back to the trench. It takes a long time to get there, mostly because it's a whopping 10 clicks forward of its previous position, past the previous battle line, past what was Rebel HQ just this morning. Partly the walk is so long because my shoes disintegrate halfway there. I'm back on level one. Mia is leaning over Turok, taking a bullet out of his leg. Colonel Stonewall Jackson is looking through some field glasses. He spits almost on me, then again in my face. He's laughing as I wipe it off. Good effect, sir? I say, nodding to the outgoing mortar fire that's turning rebels into pixie dust, but thinking of something else, maybe I forget. I guess, Colonel Jackson says. As he steps leisurely into the slot pit, a kid about my age tackles him. As much as you can tackle a steroided behemoth like a four nim knight, he takes his dick out of his pants and shakes it a bit. Colonel Jackson does that to the kid's dick. Not quite daddy's size yet. Nope, but I'm finna be. For a moment, I'm touched. Then I forget. I squat in the NCO pig pen behind a euphoric looking sow and pee. And that's it. Damn. <laughs> Man, I, you know, I read that a few times, obviously. But hearing you read it made me realize, like, there were part, like, uh, the one thing that always blows me the fuck away about your writing is how so many things mean multiple things while they're being said. Like, you'll have individual phrases, and I know I'm explaining this very poorly, but you'll have individual phrases that have, like, a multiplicity of, like, puns and meaning to them. And... It, I, while listening to you like read, I picked up on a few that I missed while reading because of the way you delivered it. Anyway, it was awesome. I, lo I love your shit. <laughs> cool. Thanks. You do love me some puns. Yeah, I do too. I feel like no one is giving you credit for like how excellent it is. <laughs> but I am at well, least right now. Well, thanks. 
So, um, who was it that was next? Um, I said Comfy Times is here. And then wanted to read. Joseph, you look really worried. Oh. Did I Comfy Times? Uh, that's what uh Vicky said in the chat. Hello, hello. Oh, cool. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um. So I have a poem called Iconoclasm that I'd like to present that I haven't published anywhere, but it's just been sitting in my docs. So um, do you have a link to it in maybe Pastebin or something or? If oh, yeah. Uh, I sent it to you. So uh, yeah, this should be the right link here. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Great. Well, All right. Take it away. Cool, cool. Bloodstained pigs with smiley face stickers plastered on their phalanx. Guardians of us all with the divine right to destroy life, the power of God in handheld steel and polymer, end it all in a flash with the twitch of an itchy finger. They present us one final choice, 9mm Parabellum for 40 Smith & Wesson. State-funded, indiscriminate, discriminatory assassins. Dorner, peace be upon him, spits down at them as our bodies hit the ground in a splash of liquid vitality and twitching gore, enough to fill an Olympic pool. No choice but to stand a cop killer for real, for real, for real, for real. Please, Daddy, more black trans women boots stomping on our heads, cry out the submissive as they pray to their elected gods facing the White House. Theoretically desperate for better, but falling for the oldest tricks in the book yet again. We will bring you real change, the blasphemous claim, as they fill their filthy pockets, coming so hard their eyes roll back over comatose becoming corpses of black and brown innocence, without even realizing what they worship with each cycle of the same. So devoid of imagination that rainbow dollars become revolutionary, so devout that nothing better seems possible. The death cult has its claws in deep and it won't let go. At least Jonestown was more honest. Drink the fucking poison and fade away like your spirit has. I'm not asking you to open your third eye, but at least open the first two for fuck's sake. Beaten into submission by their own devotion to stability, still with her as the nation burns righteously to the ground. Countless different bumper stickers for a herd of the same heretics. It's fucking pathetic. The psychotic are more in touch with reality. I voted. Doesn't this put a smile on your face? Doesn't this feel good? Don't you dare abstain from checking a box. That's real politics. Put the blue racist rapist of our choice into divine power. Why won't you lie down and rot for Moloch like the rest of us? Do you even know what you believe in, motherfucker? Do you even believe in anything, motherfucker? Maybe you should just fucking die already and let the rest of us handle this. Intersectional drone pilot brings holy flame to the promised land of milk and honey, of rags and riches of AGM-114 Hellfire, countless war machines branded with slain people. The audacity takes my breath away. Our existence is the condemnation of everything that is recognized today. We are at war. We will not bow to your false idols. Wow. Wow, yeah. that was amazing. <laughs> Thank you. I love the, uh, the line that really got me was intersectional drone pilot brings ho holy flame to the promised land of milk and honey of rags and riches of AGM. 114 hellfire that's just man there's just so much brilliance going on there there's a lot going on there period but man that's, Thank that's you. amazing yeah holy fucking shit i love it <laughs> <laughs> Aww. that was powerful as fuck <laughs> really good Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. oh uh, is oh, there sorry. anyone else who wanted to read can't hear anyone. Oh, did somebody say they can't hear me? I can hear you. Oh, you can hear me? Okay. Yeah, I think I think uh did Eris say she couldn't hear you or? I thought Eris maybe said she couldn't hear me, but um so anyone else want to read here before we yeah. wrap up or I can read something. You can hey. read something? Yeah. Okay. Why not? Away. <laughs> I'm on uh I'm on my third cider, so why not? Nice. Yep, Eris did just say that she can't hear. Oh, she can't hear us. That's unusual. Oh, maybe she's going to come back, I guess. Oh, oh yeah, maybe. Maybe it probably was a problem on her end because I know I can mute yeah. people, but I can't prevent people from hearing. So. All right. And uh, I'm actually going to provide a link to this one. Cool. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a companion piece to the one that I read last week. Uh, written after the same breakup. So this should be interesting for everybody. And I actually have a fun little uh, 
add-on for the end that was brought to me by a much more petty friend than I am. So, uh, it can be startling how a moment of pain can bring your world crashing down around you. Even if you have doubts about something, doubts about whether it'll last or about whether it'll fail, when you've ripped it away from you, it still cuts as deep as any knife. So you bandage it up, you stitch your wounds, but you don't pretend that they aren't there. You do what conventional wisdom says is healthy. You try to stifle the emotional wounds so that it doesn't fester and rot within your skin. You let it breathe every so often and you hope and pray that the world doesn't decide to reopen the wound at the wrong time. It can be startling how a moment of pain can bring about a moment of true clarity. You can spend weeks or months preparing for what you might do or say when that moment arrives, when you have the chance to either realize that you've healed or a shot at tearing the same wound open in the one who hurt you. You can play that moment over and over again inside your head and be sure of exactly how you want to handle the situation, but when that moment of pain is relived and clarity is revealed, you can hardly prepare yourself for that. See, I've just had one of those moments and taken a week to process it. So picture this. You build a relationship, and it's a solid one. You have some doubts about the fundamentals. Religion, family, question of children, personal mental health. You spend months questioning why there's pressure being put on to spend time with her family when all she's ever done is complain about how miserable they are and tell you how much they disapprove of you based solely on your last name. And then you discover that she's been unfaithful. Maybe not physically, not yet, but seeing someone else behind your back. You see the first sign of it and you elucidate how much it damages the trust, the vital and essential trust of a relationship. And in order to repair that, it cannot happen again. And then when you think things have recovered, it happens again. So you shut down, drowned by the anger and the pain of what you've been put through and immediately see it continue. So you end things for your own sake. She denies what she's done. She says nothing has happened, but then makes it quite visible what's been going on. So you walk away or you try to. She tries to remain within your social circle, making plans with people close to you. Those plans fall through because of the man she betrayed you with, so you react in a natural fashion, confronting her on the matter. She still denies the undeniable and shuts you out completely. You spend weeks recovering, keeping those wounds stitched shut, letting them breathe by venting to those around you. Later, you find out that she may have also been rekindling an old affair from before your relationship. That doesn't hurt as much, but still inflames the wound. The bitterness remains, but the pain fades. Eventually, the resentment is all that's left. But then the moment of your would-be anniversary arrives. It's a sad day. It's a frustrating day. But you push through it. Until she shows up that day at a place and time she knew you'd be, with her choice of betrayer in tow. And then you find your moment of clarity. So I've taken a week to process it. I had to. You see, when that kind of moment hits, you can only really experience the most prominent part of the emotions involved. What felt like pain wasn't. There were no lingering attachments, no clinging to what could have been, no desire to try to fix anything. There was only bitterness and anger. The kind of anger that poets in ancient times would have used to describe apocalypses and Armageddons, the kind that can barely be contained in a human body. It's easy to blame it on the other man. It really is. It's a natural outlet and far more socially acceptable to say that you'd like to beat him into unconsciousness. But the blame isn't solely on him. He was just a tool after all in more ways than one and the sort of tool that couldn't respect the fact that a relationship existed in the first place and one who's been revealed to do this sort of thing more than once. The blame for the wounds inflicted by infidelity fall on the one who committed the act of betrayal. She caused this. She caused this with her inability to actually say if there was an issue, her inability to remain true, and her inability to be honest about what was happening. She caused it with her lack of concern for the amount of pain she was about to inflict, and she made it worse by lying to my face after the fact. But I do believe that the moment that followed was one of her own pain the pain of realizing what she had done. 
I remember watching her attempt in vain to fix things when the wound was still fresh and that being followed by throwing salt after her attempts were rebuked. Now I hold no pity and no regrets for standing up and casting aside that which wasn't meant for me, that which could not be true to me. And just as that first moment of pain brought a moment of clarity, I now sit and experience a moment of patience. And in that moment of patience, I know what is to come. I know that the forces that guide this universe, whatever you may believe them to be, have a twisted sense of justice that will always enact itself. Justice is merciless, and the powers that be are far more cruel than I would ever hope to be. No matter how violent my thoughts may have become when I set eyes on the one who I was betrayed by and the one who I was betrayed for. Karmic justice may not always be swift, but its callous and passionless execution is inevitable. So that's the piece. Oh, yeah. And uh, yeah. the entertaining follow through is that about... Uh, I'm waiting for this because yeah, I already yeah, have... Rudy already knows where this is going because this is a very <laughs> funny one. <laughs> so about three months after that breakup, uh, my ex confirmed that she was in fact seeing the guy that uh, I accused her of cheating with. And following that, details kind of came out that everything had started several months beforehand. Well, a couple months ago, oddly enough, same time of year, uh, it's brought to my attention from a friend who, uh, like I said, is a little more petty than I am and actually is keeping up on the situation, discovers that their relationship had ended. And uh, <laughs> this is just so entertaining to me. It ended because he decided to come out of the closet and break off their engagement and that he had started that in that relationship the exact same amount of time that she had uh, pulled that nonsense on me. So karmic justice executing itself three years after the fact, always entertaining. Jesus, that's some soap opera. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any Couldn't reason? write it if I, if I wanted to, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> The guy in question is my therapist at uh, the psych. <laughs> Wait, yeah, really? Even better layers to it. <laughs> well, he, wasn't, really? he, was, he was like a um, like a like uh, a peer they call it, I guess, which is someone you can talk to and that kind of thing. But I knew the guy. Yeah. Huh. Wow. That yeah, was so entertaining. <laughs> was like, yikes. <laughs> I have exes that pretended to date each other through live journals over their mutual hatred towards me, which I think is amazing. <laughs> Uh, well, that is that is imp that is impressive. <laughs> it is. I can. Yeah, I, I won't go on about them. Um, but it's amazing. That's how powerful your writing is. That I can just come in. I don't know how what I how much I miss. I'm still holding in my pee because I don't want to miss this. But like, yet yeah, work is so powerful. It's awesome. Thank you. Of the power is in the voice too because you got that good radio voice it's amazing i been so tired of that you should just be like hello what are you talking about <laughs> <laughs> one day <laughs> but he does he has the radio voice i've i've had friends basically peer pressure me into uh, inhaling helium <laughs> and it just makes me sound like a normal person i thought you were gonna say force into you into like doing other things and i was really relieved that it was that <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yikes. So, uh, did anyone else want to read? Eris, so you said you were going to read, right? Yeah. Okay. Sure, I'll read the thing that got blow. Wait, let's see. Sucking dick as a tag on misery tourism. <laughs> oh, man. Which All one? right, there. <laughs> that's, that's a prestigious. Honestly, uh, I did not expect this to get accepted. And. <laughs> So thank you. Yeah, no, it, it blew Rudy and I away. No pun yeah. intended, you know. <laughs> also, thank you for putting it as fiction. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was one of our favorite uh, pieces to illustrate. <laughs> oh my God, yes. I'm like, I would get it tattooed, but then you would, you said I would be an influencer and then I was like, oh my God, no. <laughs> okay, so. Several pictures she sent me before she died were, her, were of her sucking Drew's dick while making a funny, insane face. 
I do have these, by the way, and they haunt me. I remember right after I knew she had died, I was looking at a picture of her sucking a dick, and I looked into her eyes, and I felt something, and I just sobbed. Last night, I went to go fuck Ryan, and it was weird. That was the bed I broke up with Mila in while I was in it. That was the bed we had a threesome in. That was the bed I almost OD'd on, but Mila gave me some activated charcoal. I went to go fuck Ryan and get some blow, and it was fun at first, whatever, but then he mentioned dead porn stars, and I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? So that makes more sense if you know that Mila is my dead ex that was a porn star. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know. No, I think that piece really like captures something honest about like the grieving process. I think we have a tendency to mm. like romanticize what it means to be suffering from grief and what loss means. And instead, a lot of it is Sucking an escape from that feeling, you know? Yeah, no, honestly, yeah. Thank you so much, because it's completely unedited, just stream of consciousness, but I really appreciate that you, but think that's awesome. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, we we love un unedited stream of consciousness. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, that's kind of what we do, and that, that piece falls right into, into that category. <laughs> Amazing. You know what story of your that's been published has been on my mind a lot is the thing. Like with the, the thing that you eat to be skinny. And then you have to like the sacrificial pubes. Oh what which one is this? Um I think Oh god. Okay. Typed in the thing. Was it a poem or? Oh no, it's a like a little story about like a kind of a, not like a worm or a parasite, but it keeps her skinny. Cause she oh has... my God, yeah, I know exactly oh, yeah. what you're talking about. What yeah. The thing, I have the link, it's called uh, Back to Normal. But, Back yeah, to normal. okay, yeah. That, was, yeah. that was a really fantastic that one. Too. That was one of my favorites from our hard fantasy theme. Um, yeah. Well, I wish we could get that author to read, actually. I'm not sure. Hmm. Um, Will you read one of yours? The author of that one, Amelia Steenkamp. Maybe we should reach out to her and see if she wants to read it, because that's one that I think would really work very well being read, you know? Yeah, that one lends itself well to reading. It's awesome. Schad Schad Schadenfreude. Schadenfreude. I don't have German. I don't even know how to pronounce it. <laughs> Yeah, you should read that one. The one. Sorry, I didn't quite catch that exchange. <laughs> Rudy, you can talk the, better than I can. The, the one, um, the uh, game you wrote about Schadenfreude. Oh, um, you should read it. I wasn't planning to read, uh, but sure, sure. Um, <laughs> yeah. So actually, if I'm going to read, I'll read two things. Mm -hmm. um, one, I'll read Schadenfreude, which is a game I wrote, and I'm only, and I'll read that because it was just requested. Uh, the other thing, since we talked about it earlier, I want to read that poem that I wrote about the Opportunity Rover. Um, oh yeah, just yeah, that's one right. second. Um, yeah, I just have to dig through. I should be able to find things on my website, but, um, but I can't. <laughs> okay, so um, this piece, it's called Schadenfreude, a game for 01. Oh, oh, hey, hey, Soren, or, sorry. Um, so yeah, this piece is called Schadenfreude, a game for one. And I wrote this as a, to go with our plague theme. This was kind of <laughs> kind of influenced by, sorry, excuse me, being locked up during the beginning of the COVID epidemic, and I uh, just kind of lying around, just um, 
just kind of soaking in my own self-pity and like sadomasochism and yeah anyway so uh schadenfreude a game for one um warning while playing this game please resist the urge to take notes or otherwise transpose or record the scenarios you imagine doing so will encourage you to smooth and polish the rough edges of your mental narratives and promote after the fact reflection on your experiences, both of which are contrary to the spirit of the game. Worse, you might be inclined to believe you've learned something valuable, that you've learned of some valuable life lesson from playing and that you'll be a better person tomorrow than you were yesterday, which is contrary to the spirit of art. You are a twisted, bitter human being. Life and mankind have been unfair to you and you've been left with years, if not decades, of unanswered social slights and interpersonal injustices. Your nightly and often daily reflections on these wrongs have gradually transported you from the realm of, God damn it, it's in French. I don't, I can write this shit, I can't read it. I think it's Le Spirit de Escalier. I, I don't know, the, it's the spirit Spirit of, d'Escalier. Thank you, thank you, Tyler. I did not take French in high school. It's basically uh, when you fantasize about uh, the things you should have or could have said after the fact. It's the wit of the staircase. Anyway, to that of mental mass murder, with your resentment, resentment fueling countless hypno, hypnagogic fantasies of vicious, gruesome revenge. What you don't know is that you're living in a computer simulation, a simulation where you are the only authentic living being and everyone and everything else is the product of an artificial intelligence that has only one objective, to make you happy. I'm realizing now that I failed to put the link in the thing. <laughs> Unfortunately, your benevolent AI host is not allowed to directly manipulate your consciousness. So it cannot simply flood your brain with endorphins and call it a day. Nor does it have a perfect understanding of the perverse complexities of human motivation and satiation. So, like any service industry professional, its work is mostly reactive. It tries to read and interpret your mood on any given day and respond accordingly, tweaking the simulation here and there to try to make you more content without destroying the fragile illusion of reality. But now, after years of perceiving your escalating dissatisfaction and reviewing your regular vengeful fantasies with helpless bewilderment, the AI has determined that drastic action must be taken. It has concluded that the only thing that will make you happy is cataclysm on a global scale. And so, with no moral imperative to protect its many artificial selves and wishing only to stimulate a positive neurochemical response within your brain, it loads the apocalypse. Imagine a global catastrophe Anything su sufficiently large in scale and rich in human suffering will do. It could be a plague, an economic depression, societal collapse, a super, a super volcano eruption, a new ice age, or any other disaster that your subconscious conjures. You should take the first calamity that comes to mind and run with it. Don't second guess yourself or fixate on why such and such a waking nightmare for the human race is too implausible or extreme the AI will worry about realism. Your only concern is your own sadistic joy. Ruminate on the details of the cataclysm. Don't obsess over the big picture or try to comprehend the entirety of what has happened. Allow your thoughts to flow freely. Entertain whatever perverse specifics pop into your head for as long as they are comfortable there and not a moment longer. Before moving on to whatever other bit of apocalyptic ugliness tickles your fancy. I won't provide any examples or details here. These are yours and yours alone to generate. Treat the process more like guided meditation than a world building exercise. The, I, the AI will read your thoughts and manifest your desires in the simulation while filling in the particulars and areas that you didn't have the, in, the inclination to consider. Once you're bored of thinking globally, shift your attention to the local and the personal. Think of a person who you believe has wronged you. How are they faring during the disaster? 
The answer, of course, is that they're doing badly. The catastrophe has ruined their life for sure, but, but how? Now's the time to get specific. Imagine as vividly as possible just how hilariously fucked they are. Imagine the toll the disaster has had on their health, their career, their relationships, their family. Maybe they're unemployed and broke. Maybe someone close to them has died. Hell, maybe they've died. Don't kill them off right away though. Or if you do, be sure to fixate on the circumstances of their death. Anything else would be an act of self-denial, which is meaningless in a world with no other selves. Keep going until you lose interest or you feel your mind is naturally starting to drift. The AI works your will and your enemy suffers. Shift your attention to the next person who comes to mind. Unlike before, this need not be someone you harbor a personal grievance against. It could be a friend or a family member or an unfamiliar acquaintance or even someone you don't know at all, like a celebrity or a politician. Or yes, it could just be some asshole you have beef with. Whatever you do, don't try to, too hard to guide this process. Accept whoever your subconscious offers you. Repeat the process above with your new victim. Contemplate on how the crisis has impacted them. Even if you'd rather not, or if you'd like to believe that you'd rather not, keep going until your mind naturally releases its prey. Don't pause to pity or moralize. Move on to the next name you're offered, repeating this process with each one. Stop playing when it becomes too uncomfortable to contemplate someone's fate, or when you become distracted by other thoughts or fall asleep. When this occurs, the AI senses your displeasure or satiation and discontinues the apocalypse, transitioning gently to normalcy after saving its changes. Oh. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, I'm, as long as I'm indulging myself, I'm going to read one more, um, I'm gonna read a poem and then, and then I'm done. <laughs> Um, this poem is called On the Loss of Opportunity. I'll put it in the, in the chat. And I was uh, talking about this earlier, basically, what was it? Over two years ago now, I guess, or no, I guess over one year ago now, there was that whole deal in the news where we lost contact with the Opportunity Rover, which uh, was the rover that NASA sent to Mars like a fucking decade ago. And when that was happening, I was really struck by like how um, like much people were romanticizing the rover and also like oddly empathizing with this piece of, I think, I think um, Josh earlier called it space junk. And yeah. I just thought that was a really weird <laughs> thing. And I ended up writing this poem about it. So anyway, it's called On the Loss of Opportunity. The first part is called, We Must Resist the Urge to Anthropomorphize the Suffering of Robots. Regarding its time on Mars, here is what we can say without resorting to sentimentality. To begin, we have the impact site, Endurance, a crater in an otherwise flat, bare plain. One of its first acts was a thorough examination of its discarded heat shield, no longer a protective barrier against its environment. Afterward, it turned south and started in the direction of Marathon. Over the course of its 5,352 souls of life, it traveled a total of 28 miles, not quite half the distance from Flint to Detroit averaging nearly 28 feet per day. The observations it gathered on rocks and the prospect of water, now gone, are invaluable. It also took a number of photographs of its surroundings and at least one self-portrait. It spent one six-week period in the spring immobilized in a sand dune and there was a high probability that it would never move again. Spirit failed, Spirit being its sister rover, Spirit failed under similar circumstances, emptying its battery in a fruitless attempt 
to extricate itself from soft soil. But opportunity was not exhausted then. Eventually, its memory began to fail and it was afflicted with amnesia. Concessions were made to its new lim limitations and the mission continued. It ended its journey sightless and enervated on the cusp of endeavor. The second part is called Dr. Call, excuse me, Dr. Carl Tanzler was ahead of his time. If any of you don't know, Dr. Carl Tanzler was this, I think, German doctor who became obsessed with this much younger woman and she contracted tuberculosis and died. And he had this lavish tomb built for her and, then, and had her buried in it. And then uh, he snuck in at night and stole her body from the tomb and took it back to his house. And um, it was discovered, I think, months later, and he had um, made modifications to it. And it was, <laughs> anyway, this was in like the 19th century, but he had, um, yeah, he had basically, as the body had begun to decay, he had started sewing it together and it was pretty clear that he was sleeping with it. Anyway, the point of the, the section, yes, <laughs> it's like one of the creepiest stories like of all time. Creepiest true stories, anyway. Anyway, so this part, this section is called Dr. Carl Tanzler was ahead of his time. Fuck your cynicism, you tell me. We'll go up there and bring her home someday. And I believe you. Mere decades from now, a Chinese plutocrat, as sentimental as he is debauched, will fund a rescue operation at hilarious expense. I am thinking of Wally he tells the craftsman hired to restore the rofer, who holds open a book advertising dozens of different varieties of plastic googly eyes. It was the first American film I saw as a child and it impacted me. Of course, the artist tells his patron. And there is one final instruction, the installation of a discrete chute, three centimeters in diameter with a trap door. <laughs> oh, and this yes. is the the last part of the poem is my battery it's called my battery is low and it's and it is getting dark which if anyone was watching the news at the time knows that was like the the last message that the rover sent it kind of romanticized final message from the rover my battery is low and it is getting dark maybe i do empathize with it with my year spent in careful analysis of the ground immediately adjacent to my feet. Maybe I do envy it, for at least it had the chance to accomplish absolutely nothing notable in space. Maybe I do admire it for making the most of a vast, lifeless world and extremely limited means. But in the end, Entropy is still entropy and dust is still dust. And there are no exceptions to universal laws, even for the most ambitious robots. So maybe I do resent him, far from the banality of earth, buried beneath dunes that are not as red as we imagine them. And that's, and that's it, <laughs> I'm done. Dude, I, I totally uh, relate. I think we're on the same fucking uh, envious of space garbage wavelength. <laughs> yeah. It felt oh, good. It was yeah. good to hear. So <laughs> envious of space garbage. That's a big mood, honestly. That's a big mood for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Big mood. Envious of space. Space. <laughs> well, no, it's not, it's not just garbage. It's not just space. It's like it's like. The most yeah. useless thing in the most vacuous place. How am I yeah. not jealous? Like, you know. Anyways, so that was amazing. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Th thank you. <laughs> yeah, really good. Yeah, I love that. I feel like every time we publish a story about NASA or how <laughs> NASA sucks, uh, Carl Sagan's ghost fades a little bit. So that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just, I think the whole thing like left me feeling really ambivalent, you know, because 
I, I don't know. It just, on the one hand, you kind of get that desire to romanticize this thing, even if it has no sentience, you know, even if it has nothing <laughs> really going on up there. Uh, you know, but on the other hand, it's like, hey, fuck, like, I'm not going to get the opportunity to die in space and be remembered <laughs> by millions of people. So <laughs> what the <Right>. fuck? <laughs> yeah, see, I don't, I don't think about the first. Uh, yeah, that's good. That's heady. That's good. No, I just think mostly about the garbage part. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, is, does anyone else want to read or are we about ready to wrap things up here? Oh, so, okay. Soren has one. After Soren, I think we'll call it a night for the reading part, but I'll leave this up for a little bit. I'll end the recording, on, but after that, if people want to socialize or whatever, that's cool. Can you hear me now? Yep, I can hear you. Cool. Yep, I hear you. Okay, take it away. All right. This doesn't have a name. It's just some bullshit that I wrote. Um, my soul has been torn asunder. Pastel purple and pink galaxy slimes is from the spot where you left. That eternal return is such a bitch. I suffered so much only to grow, only to get to where I am now, and it's not with you. Nothing has been gained. Everything that has not been saved has been lost. Continue. This is not what I wanted. I wanted so much more time with you. I still love you so much. This pain is incredible. This love we've laid, laid, we've laid waste has a whole new taste. You've depersonalized again. You're here, but you're not cognizant of me. You choked me tonight. And you said you didn't know why that meant so much to me. It's like you've heard me, but you've never listened to me. Maybe you only ever glistened to me. Invalidated emotions, invalidated love, invalidated parking. Off into cyberspace where you're completely free. And now that I think about it, anyone would probably choose complete freedom over their soulmate, especially if their soulmate was me. I love the pastel purple and pink galaxy slime parts and the such a bitch part too. That was really cool. Mm. Yeah, that was great. Um, was awesome. Like in the final line, there's basic whatever. I could barely. Oh, do you like? Do you like my weird howling, floating demon skull? <laughs> yeah, that's you awesome. Time on that. Oh my god. I actually, yeah, I, I did. I did that myself. Oh really? Oh cool. Yeah. You got a light bulb in it? Is that what it is, or some kind of light? Say what now? LED. Do you have like an LED or a light bulb inside of it so it glows? Is that? No, nah, man. I that's all Photoshop. Oh, we photo. Oh, okay. I thought it was real. <laughs> yeah. Oh no! Oh god! It was like a real uh, piece of art. Let me know oh, if, uh, if that's any awesome. Of you want something illustrated. I'm totally fucking down and bored. So. Oh damn! Awesome. Yeah, I'll keep you in nice. mind. That looks really cool. Hell yeah. Yeah, this is the person I was telling you about who wrote the CSS poem. Oh, yeah, that, that's me. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> yep. And then you tell him. Yep. So at this point, I think I'm going to end the recording. Um, and uh, I'll leave the, I might step away for a few minutes, but I'm going to read, leave the meeting up until, you know, people decide to leave. If you want to hang around and chat and socialize. And you'll also cut out that little part with the, the, the yeah. thing. Yeah. Yep. Yes. There be <laughs> anyway. So I'm going to stop the recording now. Uh, if you're watching this after the fact, thanks for tuning in, and thank you everyone who read today. I really appreciate 
all the support these readings have had. So thanks, guys. And uh, thank you, William and Rudy. Thank you so much. Thank you.